be different. I understand that they are different. Uh, but I just think that, you know, for us, it feels like we're one community across Canada and just really want to stress that to you. So I, I appreciate your time and I appreciate to having more conversations with you and your team that we work with on a regular basis here with New Channel and hope to continue to make progress and find some real reconciliation. I know a lot of us deep in our minds have the issue of the RCMP were the ones that took our children to residential schools. And how do we fix that? How do we erase that from our minds and you know, just deal with it, making things right? And everybody's gonna be different. And I know you know that. So appreciate um, having the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the assembly for um, the meeting today. Thank you, President Sayers, and you raised some very important and critical points uh, moving forward. So I'll try and address uh, three of the issues you brought up. The uh, de-escalation, as we call it, or, or use of force, is always um, a challenge. And I know particularly in our Indigenous communities, uh, and particularly in those that uh, only have a, a few police officers present, when use of force is issued, it's the very divisive in the community. Uh, it's painful, and not only for the officers involved, but more importantly for the communities and for the relationships and for the families. And so we are committed uh, and currently are underway doing a, I would call it a revitalization or revamping our national, what we call our de-escalation model. It used to be called, to tell you how times have changed, it used to be called a use of force model. It is now called a de-escalation because at the end of the day, the whole goal of any police interaction is for there not to be violence. And I can assure you that there's no, no police officer that goes to work uh, in the morning hoping that that's the day they get to use some type of force. And so the use of force in any occasion can be very traumatic and very damaging. And we are certainly committed to, uh, to uh, engaging in, in the development of a model that will see safety in our communities with the least amount of intervention possible. So that is currently underway and we're actually partnering with chiefs of police across Canada outside of the RCMP to try and develop a national model so that all police will be using uh, the same uh, model in de-escalation. Wellness checks, that is a challenge for policing and I think it, it brings together the culmination of a lot of the issues that we deal with in the community, whether it be mental health, addictions, et cetera. Um, in, a, in a perfect world, police would not be uh, responsible for wellness checks. Uh, we would have the appropriate health services in place or the, uh, or the social services that would be able to do that job. Unfortunately, in some of the communities, the police, particularly the RCMP, are the only representatives in the community. And when there's a call, we must respond. But I think with increased training, with increased awareness, we will be able to foster an approach that, again, would bring the least amount of intervention uh, possible. And we're certainly committed to doing that. And I can assure you uh, that the RCMP do value our relationships in our Indigenous communities. It is one of the pillars of, uh, of our commitments, uh, not only for the RCMP, but for public safety. It is an ever-present um, point on our mandate letters, on our job description, and it's one that I and our team hold dear to heart. So we certainly are here to listen um, and continue to listen and can build these relationships with you uh, that are Indigenous-led, that are culturally informed, and I think, uh, uh, I think we're making great strides and I'm excited about where we're gonna go together in the future. So thank you once again. Uh, I had one person add themselves to the speakers list and I have a hard time saying no to an elder. Uh, so just before we go to our last speaker on the list, uh, microphone 24, we did have some remarks shared online as today is a hybrid situation, Deputy Commissioner. So online, Chief Leslie Aslan of the uh, Tatsildan uh, Nation said, um, I'd like to echo my concerns within the North as well and frustration my community has regarding the understaffed detachment at Fort St. James, areas they serve as five other First Nation communities. I'd like to connect with you and see how we can have a community protection law that our leadership is creating to help leadership fill the gaps we see the RCMP ignoring. We, are, we have dumped a lot of money into it and running it through legal. I'd like to share a report on the community security gate we have in place to help battle the drugs and crimes that is 
happening in community and how it is effective. His, his email is also shared there, and we'll okay. make sure that comes to you um, via email. So thank, thank you. you so much. So we're going to wrap up with the microphone 24, um, and, and thank you. So 24, please. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, my name is Herbert Morvin, and I'm chair for the Council of Elders for Nisgat Lissom's government. We've been working to get a good relationship with the RCMP and the fisheries and oceans personnel. And uh, the harder we work, it seems that we're not being heard. And I always wonder about that. We must apply to our lives what it is that we're looking for. It's time for us again to apply our ancestors' wisdom, our ancestors' knowledge about how to receive what it is that we're looking for, that we want. It's time for us again to own what it is we're experiencing. We have to show who we are. We have to begin to protect our lives because it's up to us. It's up to us. No one has a responsibility for my life. It's up to me. And when we hear, I appreciate your words. How is that received by the person who's offering those words in response to what we're saying, to what we're recommending? Are they applying those words they appreciate to the responsibility That's where we are. We've come a long way. It's time for us to be who we were born to be. I work at understanding what my responsibility is. I work to own it so that I could be the one to resolve it. When we say it's someone else's responsibility, then what can we say about it? We have to begin to own this experience we're having today. This morning, come go it wilt will it at Sigram Nak and Kungad Kotla. This morning we were blessed with the spiritual knowledge of one of our matriarchs before the meeting started. What did you receive from her words? How did she encourage you to take your place now? And this is what I am sharing with you because too often 
we're looking over there to deal with this issue. Racism is there all the time. But we can live with it because we are who we are. We're still here. Our spirits are well, connected. And when we say, what are you going to do to help me? And I haven't shown you what I need. How do I expect you to be supportive of what it is that I'm asking you to do? So I share this with you because you are where you are supposed to be today. You're the leader of your community. You're the pillar. You have deep roots. And with that deep-rooted knowledge of your words in your respective languages, our ancestors are guiding you because they created those words to express that knowledge and that apply it so that it becomes wisdom. When we live who we are, no one can take anything away from you. I've gone through a whole lot of hardship And I've worked really hard to own my life. And so I can walk to that man over there and say, this is what I would like you to do with, with me, not for me, with me. Then we're living it what it is that we're asking for support to do. Everything we ask for, we should demonstrate with our lives so that it's alive. The relationship we should be having with this man should be alive. And through your spirit and his spirit, it will become alive because of your understanding of your responsibility to life. I just wanted to share that because it seems that we're always looking over there to get things resolved. Our mothers do the best that they can with what they have to nurture us. They create harmony in the home because they understand diversity. They live with it every day. That's who our mothers are. They create harmony in the home with the best that they can. So thank you for this opportunity. And I pray that when we leave here, we're walking with our heads high and we're walking with a firm stride that says, I'm going to be responsible for what happens in my home and what happens to my life. And I'm going to be working to get support for the needs of our community. Not asking, but working. 
to get it done. Thank you. <laughs> We're going to wrap up on those wise words. Thank you so much, Deputy Commissioner McDonald, for joining us today and your staff. As I said earlier, they will be still in the room, as he had indicated, near the back of the room for any uh, questions that you have uh, for your community needs. Um, and now we're going to go to the next item on our agenda, which is the BC Assembly of First Nations Economic Development Strategy. As we have Regional Chief T uh, Terry TG, and as you can see, Minister Callan uh, from Jobs, Economic Recovery, and Innovation is joining us, and not via Zoom. How wonderful for you to take the time to join us in person. I actually need to. Oh well, you stay there. It's okay. I'm um, just going to check in with. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So we'll. We're, it's going to go over there, and we will be starting off. Yeah, sure. Let's do it here. So, yeah, well, he's going to just, um, no, you stay there, and he's going to come right there next. Oh, there you go. We're all, We're good. I'm not trying to make musical chairs, I swear. <laughs> I just want to make sure that we are, have everybody together and available on microphones for when we move into the moderated questions. So um, we'll start off with Regional Chief TG, and then we'll go over to Minister Callum. Microphone two, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Deneza, Sekuza, Skyza. Samoyget, Simonak, Simoyget. Chiefs, hereditary chiefs, delegates. First of all, I just want to, to acknowledge the uh, territory of the Musqueam, the Coast Salish people, the unceded, unsurrendered, continually occupied territory. Thank you for allowing us on this. Uh, sacred grounds to do this uh, important work and, and as we heard in the uh, policing section of how important it is to have uh, relationships with um, entities and organizations uh, so for the betterment of our people and uh, my uh, before I get started on the economic development uh, portion of our uh, agenda, I do hold the uh, file uh, at the AFN with uh, Jocelyn Picard on, on policing and justice. And uh, here in British Columbia, we're fortunate to have a BC First Nations Justice Council and implementing the uh, justice strategy that has been fully supported by the, the provincial government. And more so, I think what was really part of the solution and is an important part is the transitioning from program funding to essential services funding that has been uh, greatly received by many of our First Nations here in British Columbia and across Canada and also within the ranks of the, the RCMP. So we can take our rightful place in terms of policing. Um, I'll, I'll just start off with, with the slide and, and um, as we all have seen and, and witnessed over the last uh, several uh, couple of weeks was the, the passing of, of Queen Elizabeth II. And, uh, and I think, you know, the, the last 70 years in, in our reign uh, really brings up the question and, and the transition to King Charles the, uh, the Third, I believe it is, is, um, and the reason why I have this, this um, uh, slide is, is to I think it really puts in light this opportunity of, of transition and looking in the last several years in regards to our relations, not only with, with the, the monarchy, but with the Crown, the federal, uh, provincial government, the RCMP, and also the Vatican. And we all know in, in our history and in, in our um, journey, there has been those, those three entities that, that took our children away. And, and many of those issues that we're dealing with, that's related to the Indian resident school system, which has transitioned into to the 60s scoop, the millennial scoop, and, and those issues that, that we're dealing with now. And I think in terms of, of that transition and change, is what we're trying to create 
and manifest in terms of our relations with uh, I wanted to acknowledge uh, Minister Kalon here for the ministers for, for jobs, economic recovery and innovation uh, we call Jerry um, is the as we come out of COVID there's there are certainly uh, many issues that that need to be dealt with uh, especially in regards to to economic recovery and far too often when economic recovery occurs uh, who's left behind our indigenous peoples our first nations people so as we transition from from one monarchy to to the next and and as we transition in terms of really bringing up the question of our relations with our our First Nations and the Crown, I, I think here's a real opportunity to see that transition, perhaps, in, in a better way. Uh, certainly, the um, uh, some of the work that we're doing at the, the AFN is, is to look at some of those opportunities for our First Nations when it comes to um, some of the work that we're doing on the national level and, and, and more regionally here in, in British Columbia. Here in Canada, in terms of, of procurement, Canada awards uh, approximately $22 billion in contracts to and services to, to First Nations. And that, that only uh, equates to 2% of uh, you know, contracts to, to Indigenous peoples. And some of the work we're doing there is, is to try to raise that to, to 5% and, and increase it even more. So that really, really would contribute to our First Nations and, and also to, to our economies. In terms of natural resources, uh, certainly uh, we, there's a number of arrangements here in British Columbia and also Canada. But I think it's, it really speaks to access to, to uh, some of those riches that are afforded to uh, perhaps uh, many levels of government and, and also to uh, private companies. And we all know the, the arrangements and, and some of the arrangements that have been made in, in such things as FCARSAs um, that fall far short than what uh, we know what we deserve, as, as especially when natural resources do come out of our respective territories. And I think what we're really doing is, is trying to, to get a redistribution of, of that wealth to our indigenous peoples, to our governments, so we don't have to rely on uh, federal coffers and uh, reliance on, on those uh, program funding to deal with uh, many of the issues that we deal with in our First Nations companies, I mean First Nations communities. Trade, the AFIN, we continue to, to look at trade as, as an opportunity uh, not only within uh, uh, trade of, of within uh, the Canada, but also internationally, uh, Indigenous trade zones. There is one that exists in, in Oklahoma. It's called um, uh, Iron Horse, and it's recognized by the federal and state government as uh, Indigenous trade zone is what we call it. And we're looking to develop uh, many more indigenous trade zones around Canada and United States and perhaps even to, to New Zealand and other areas so we could freely trade uh, goods, not just as stated in the Jay Treaty as, um, you know, goods that are uh, very minimal in terms of, of contributing to economy, more on, on the commercial side so we could uh, really contribute to our econ economies. Uh, agriculture, well, one of the things that uh, we're, we're trying to do in, in, at the, the AFN, and also I know there has been a table here in British Columbia to, to look at agriculture. Um, in the history of, of Canada, when uh, treaties were developed, there was opportunities for our First Nations to, to be a part of uh, agriculture and farming. Matter of fact, some of the best farmers in Canada back in the day were uh, First Nations. However, at that time, there was a really internal, uh, I suppose, uh, from the outside farmers, non-Indigenous farmers were really undermined many of our First Nations, and, and that can't happen again. 
Uh, here in British Columbia, there is opportunities for, for farming, and I know there, there has been a table that has been del uh, developed with uh, First Nations at those tables to look at what are those opportunities and, and what can happen in the future. The information highway, the, the, um, it used to be, um, in, in terms of economic development, were physical highways, roads, access to different places within the province of BC that really contributed to, to our economies. And that's really the, the extraction of natural resources and what have you. Nowadays, it has really transitioned and, and is transitioning even more into the information highway and connectivity. We're glad to, to see uh, from the federal and provincial government the 800 million plus uh, contributions to uh, connectivity to, to remote areas in British Columbia. And certainly, we need to be a part of those discussions in, in terms of access to high-speed internet. And I know, certainly know over the last couple of years, and, and in this meeting right now, that uh, many of our people are online and one of the big challenges um, is having reliable, high-speed internet in our First Nations and remote communities, and also um, access to, um, which involves uh, uh, cell companies and perhaps information in terms of uh, on highways and, and perhaps even, you know, taking over some of those areas. I, I certainly know. Uh, this has come up uh, uh, time and again. Uh, perhaps, you know, First Nations should, should take over some of those areas. And I certainly know this has come up from uh, Chief James Hobart in terms of accessing some of that uh, the spectrum so First Nations uh, don't rely on, on the big four, Rogers, TELUS, and what have you. So I know that it is happening in the United States and, and moreover in, in um, uh, places like uh, New Zealand. Certainly, uh, one of the, 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 the work that we're doing at BCAFN is, is to contribute to our knowledge of, of what's really going on within First Nations uh, economy. Uh, what we're looking at here is uh, $4.08 billion. This is a very preliminary um, uh, portion of, of a report that, that we began uh, a few short months ago with uh, M&P. And uh, we look forward to uh, continue to that work and, and finding more information in regards to our participation. And moreover, uh, this really contributes to, to what we're doing in terms of economic development, looking at how much First Nations contributed to the GDP of uh, British Columbia. We already know you have some stats in, in Manitoba and the East Coast. I think Alberta is doing the same thing. Uh, the point being is that we, we need to understand and look at how much we contribute to the economy, but also uh, what portion of, of that is, uh, comes directly back to our First Nations economies and, and contributes to our economies. And also further to this, to, to supplement uh, some of the work that we've done, is the work that we've done on, on health and wellness. You can find that on our uh, website. It, it looks at the, the health and wellness of our Indigenous peoples more and more. Um, countries are doing this. It, it's really not just looking at the, the contributions uh, and the, of the money, but it's looking at the mental health and our wellness. And uh, as you probably already know, that, that report isn't great for Indigenous peoples because, once again, uh, health and wellness is a, a very challenging within our First Nations uh, uh, communities. It's, it's Traditionally, um, many uh, countries, uh, especially uh, post-1930s uh, and 40s, looked at the GDP, gross domestic product, where we want to take a more holistic look, not just GDP, but also the health and well-being of our indigenous peoples, and, and look at how our perspective and, and I certainly know this in, in, in my community and many communities in, in British Columbia, we take a holistic look at how we're doing as Indigenous peoples. It's not just one piece. Far too often, uh, the traditional uh, Western way is just to look at silos 
It may tell part of the story, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And that's what we really need to get to is the whole story. Uh, we do have, uh, as I've reported before in previous meetings, is, is the center of excellence concept. And, and certainly I appreciate the, the uh, support from the chiefs at this table and the support from the, the provincial government to, to um, you know, go down this road as part of uh, building, uh, I, I suppose, what the, the concept was, was to, to create more uh, help and, and, and more resources for our First Nations communities and more capacity in terms of economic development. So uh, as you well know, with the uh, BC Business Council, the uh, Champions Table developed the Black Books, and this is carrying on to uh, of the Black Books to, to the second part to the Center of Excellence. And certainly that's a, um, an entity that will probably, that will, I should say, will cre be created on its own. The future certainly is uh, relations with Indigenous peoples. As we implement the United Nations Declaration provincially and federally, more and more uh, governments want uh, relations with our Indigenous peoples. And I'm glad to see that private companies are, st are starting to, or if not, have implemented not only the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations, but are also looking at un to UNDRIP to create those relations with our Indigenous people. So, um, you know, if there are projects that, that can be partnered, if there are projects that need First Nations consent, that it's under your terms. And that, that was really important concept in terms of the work that we do at, at the First Nations Leadership Council in the, the National Action Plan, or in our action plan uh, provincially, the 89 commitments, is to create that space so First Nations uh, can um, implement their uh, ability to, to get to free prior and informed consent uh, whether it's through Section 7 agreements or what we would like to see as, as a global uh, agreements with First Nations on Section 7 and further to that is fully um, breathe life into free prior and informed consent so we can all benefit from the natural resources and, and from the resources that are coming out of our respective communities. So that, that really uh, summarizes some of the work that we're doing right now. And, and uh, uh, thank you once again uh, for, for allowing me to say a few words and, and certainly our relations. And as uh, Samoy get talked about there, about our responsibility and our relations with not only different entities such as the RCMP and policing, but also our relations with uh, the provincial government I think right now there is a real opportune time over the last uh, few years here as we, we see UNDRIP, as we see the commitments and, and the uh, reflections of our Crown relations uh, and also with the uh, really coming to, to the forefront of our relations with uh, other organizations. We, we are implementing the In Plain Sight report on racism and trying to do, deal with racism within the healthcare system. And I think within that um, realm, if I, if I may, is that there, there will be positive movements for, for the most part from what we are looking at in terms of uh, the, the legislation that, that is coming forward. Um, I, myself, Cheryl Casimir, and, and Don Tom have been monitoring the implementation. And the reason I bring that up and, and also the issues of, of the previous speaker talking, we, we were talking about racism is that, um, and, uh, and also the commitments from the provincial government to, to implement uh, legislation on, on racism. Uh, it, it's, it's creating that space so, we've, so we can change our relationship, not only with uh, organizations and entities out there, but I think moreover, if we can get it there, then, then overall perhaps there's a real discussion in terms of our relations with uh, the Canadian society in British Columbia so we can properly deal with, with the issue of racism and, and we can all make this place a better place that is British Columbia and Canada. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you. So it's just before we go to you, Minister Callan, I just want to gently remind everybody, I know it's day three, and I know it's been a while since we've been together. And I know most people are very discreet every now and then, and we get a little bit of boisterous, and it does take away from our presenters. So I'm just going to ask for some respect for the speakers at this time. Thank you very much. We'll now go to Minister Kellen. Delighted you're with us today. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Rochelle, and uh, thank you for the, uh, the warm welcome. I want to uh, start by acknowledging uh, the territory of the Musqueam Nations, and I'm grateful to be here, and thank you for hosting this uh, fantastic event. I want to thank uh, Councillor Howard Grant for the uh, welcome in the back there when I walked in, and uh, his advice that I should keep out of trouble today, and uh, I, I intend to take his advice and uh, stay out of trouble. So thank you. Thank you for the wise words. Um, uh, of course, I want to thank uh, uh, Gwendolyn Point and Chief Robert Josephs for their um, opening blessings this morning, and want to thank the BC Assembly of First Nations for uh, a gracious welcome to your uh, annual general meeting. I'm honored to be here and uh, continue the work that we're doing together to, to bolster Indigenous economic growth throughout BC. Now, as we continue to work with communities uh, to recover from the pandemic and, of course, natural disasters, we know that the past two years have been extremely challenging for uh, many, uh, changing lives, changing economies, and, uh, and our future. COVID-19, along with some uh, extreme weather events and, of course, discovery of the unmarked graves at residential schools have had a disproportionate uh, impact on communities uh, as well as uh, women, uh, elders, and, and our youth. And so I want to say I honour uh, your resilience through these uh, challenging, challenging times. Uh, through our recently launched uh, Stronger BC Economic Plan, our government is working to advance our shared commitment to reconciliation by engaging with First Nations as a respected partner in the economy. We can create economic opportunities that benefit First Nations and advance reconciliation. As part of the ongoing work, we're pleased to see that Indigenous peoples' uh, employment numbers have increased dramatically, uh, up 18% uh, year over year, which is uh, an increase to 22,000 uh, jobs. But we know there's uh, a lot more to do to ensure that the benefits of an economic recovery, like Chief uh, Regional TG highlighted, are equitably shared. To help us meet our goals, we're taking some uh, actions. By uh, connecting everyone in the province by 2027, no matter where they live, so that every community has access to high-speed internet. We're supporting resilient communities with modern infrastructure, uh, building hospitals, schools, housing, and investing in some new clean technologies. We're also supporting the BC First Nations Tech Council on the delivery of the uh, Digital Horizons, the Indigenous Technology Training of the New Economy Program. This project will train and equip 135 participants with the skills required for in-demand jobs in BC's technology and tech-enabled economies. This work advances BC's reconciliation and re 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 uh, recovery goals by training First Nations, Métis and Inuit people throughout this province, contributing to an increased participation amongst Indigenous peoples in Canada's information and communications technology sector, and to the self-determination of First Nations. This is a fundamental shift in how we think about economic development, diversification and growth. These investments are uh, key parts in how this economic plan that we've laid out is, is different. The plan, plan is, uh, lays out a roadmap to advance true, lasting and meaningful reconciliation, when, which is non-negotiable uh, condition for long-term economic growth. Uh, it's, uh, it's a future where we believe First Nations can uh, benefit socially, culturally and economically from land resources uh, on their territories and includes having access to multiple and diverse streams of revenues to help finance government's delivery of services to your citizens. Uh, I do want to say that uh, the work we've been doing with uh, the team here, uh, with the regional chief TG and others, um, I think is, is groundbreaking. I, I want to um, acknowledge that, that one slide that highlighted um, the, uh, the work that's been happening over the last few months to uh, change the way we uh, track uh, economic progress in our communities. 
it is uh, fundamentally going to change how we uh, do business uh, going forward. I have to say that uh, the two years of being in this role, I have found that the conversation is changing. Uh, before, when we talked about the economy, uh, people talked about tax cuts, uh, they talked about credits, they talked about um, you know specific projects. Now communities throughout this province are talking about mental health, they're talking about childcare, they're talking about uh, reconciliation and how we uh, strengthen our relationships with our Indigenous partners. And, and that is a fundamental shift for the province of BC, but that connection between social and environment is something that Indigenous communities have been doing for much longer than we've been here. And so perhaps the rest of us are catching up. Uh, and I think the work that, um, that, uh, that we're endeavoring on in the, in the coming weeks and months ahead is going to be groundbreaking, I think, not only for First Nations communities, but I think a model for us in the province. So I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today, and I look forward to any questions questions that may come. Thank you so very much to our minister as well as to Regional Chief TG. I have, uh, we'll go to 19 then 21. So uh, microphone number 19 for a question please. Hi Minister, um, nice to have you here today. Um, Chief Gail Fort Nelson, First Nation. So. As the chair of the First Nation Major Projects Coalition, I'm aware of a wide range of Indigenous projects that are being built and they're very successful. Um, you know, yesterday there was an announcement from Hydro One in Ontario where they're setting a precedence of 50% equity going to First Nations for any infrastructure that will be on Indigenous lands that uh, you know, are impacted, you know. So the other thing too is in uh, Manitoba, um, the Hudson Bay Railway to Port Nelson is also um, gonna be owned by a group of First Nations and the province kicked in 73 million and the feds kicked in 60 million. And so my question to you is, how are we going to catch up to these examples of what's happening in this country because BC Hydro has an obligation to reconcile with First Nations, and I think Hydro One is setting a precedence there. Um, you know, in Fort Nelson, you're well aware that we're having challenges. We have a viable project in um, the uh, pellet plant that we're looking at creating, and um, the facility is there waiting to just start up. But I feel like there's some confusion within your own government with um, the thought that maybe this isn't viable. Um, you know, we uh, did a lot of work for the past five years. We um, got the biggest community forest with the Northern Rockies municipality. Um, we were awarded uh, 1.26 million. Um, sorry, I'm just a little bit uh, stressed out to say. Um, it's just, it's just really frustrating because, you know, Fort Nelson First Nation has really contributed to the wealth of BC. Um, $12.6 billion has come out of our territory since 1974. And uh, there's a lot of people that are just suffering. You know, we've seen people lose their homes. We've seen people being separated, not being able to... Uh, to work in Fort Nelson, um, you know, not being able to be with their kids. And uh, the social issues are starting to increase. And, you know, there's a lot of mental health issues. Um, we don't have the proper health care. You know, we can't even have a baby in Fort Nelson. And people are asked to leave eight weeks before um, their due date. So there's a lot of challenges happening in Fort Nelson. And we've worked really hard to ensure that, you know, we're going to be an economic powerhouse and that we bring our treaty partners alongside with us. Um, the potential for this pellet plant is huge because <clears throat> it could provide about a thousand jobs and right now in Fort Nelson there's no jobs and there's no, no oil and gas activity, there's no forestry, there's nothing and people are, are suffering. It, it just breaks my heart. 
Um, when I see announcements that the government is contributing $2.4 billion to the SkyTrain in Langley to build a 17-kilometer um, railway, it just really hurts my heart because we're trying to work with you guys to repair, repair the railway from Fort Nelson to Buick, which is just outside of Fort St. John. We've worked with uh, CN Rail to realize the stream. Um, you know, we have an application into the feds for the Pathways Corridor, and in order for that to be successful, we need a contribution from the provincial government. Um, the railway needs about $75 million worth of repairs, and that's just 68% less than what you're investing in, in Langley. And uh, with the contribution from the provincial government, that will really unlock the potential in the Fort Nelson First Nation territory. We need an economy. We need your help, Minister. And it's getting frustrating just hearing no, because I actually want to sit down and have a really good conversation about this. Um, we need to get to yes. The people in the Northern Rockies region are counting on it. And uh, if we don't find a solution, then um, I don't know what's going to happen to Fort Nelson. It potentially could be a ghost town. So I think that, um, you know, there is a potential for, you know, First Nations to own this railway, you know, and I don't think that economic reconciliation should have any limits. And I'm really starting to feel that this government doesn't want to develop anything or build anything. And it's getting quite frustrating. Um, I know you well. I mean, I sat on the economic task force with you. Um, you know, we're starting to open up the, the province. But I think those discussions still need to be had. We have, still have a lot of work to do. And um, I look forward to having this conversation with your ministry because this, this, this is our livelihood. Like, we are suffering up in Fort Nelson. And it's so heart-wrenching as a leader to see your people suffer. So let's get to work. Um, but I tell you, this investment would help us tremendously. I mean, we've built roads, we've built hospitals for the rest of the province. And here we are, ready to go, but we need your help. And so, yeah, just look forward to having that conversation with you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Chief Gale. Um, I, um, I, I appreciate it. it's been a, it's been a challenging time with uh, you know a decline of forestry activity in in that region, and uh, and I appreciate the um, you highlighting the impact on real people uh, when that happens. Uh, I think out of respect for um, the discussions uh, around this proposal, I don't think probably this place is a, a place where you know we should be having that uh, exchange about the numbers and, uh, and the contributions. But I would say that um, uh, we have had uh, numerous conversations with the proponent, uh, the the company that uh, that you're looking to partner with, um, and uh, and there were some, I guess, different communications uh, that we were getting, that you were getting, and uh, in the last two days, I think you perhaps have seen some emails of communicating with them on um, the message we were getting and the message perhaps others were getting, and, and getting some clarity on what it is were, the ask was. I have to say that. Um, we have written to the federal government for the uh, grant that the company wrote for for the rail line. It's uh, it's federal territory, and uh, and uh, we have come forward, as you know, with a, um, what we believe is a significant contribution around tenure. And uh, but I appreciate there's a lot more work that needs to be done, and uh, it's not going to be resolved here, um, unfortunately. But I do think that. Um, you know, investments, uh, you know, often in my role, people come to us and say, well, you're making an investment in this community. How come you're not making it in here? And, and it's always hard, especially when communities need those investments. But um, uh, we're very alive to the, the proposal. We want to make sure that it's successful. Uh, we have been supportive of it. Uh, and uh, again, you're aware of the exchanges over the last uh, few days, just to get some clarity from the company involved on uh, information that perhaps uh, um, isn't uh, aligned with what we've been told in the past. Thank you. We'll go to microphone number 21. To Chief Don Harris, uh, Douglas First Nation. 
A um, couple of things. First one is uh, a comment. Every community have access to high-speed internet. This is something that's been on the table for quite a few years. I think the last 10 or 15 years we've been hearing that. Every, the, every community is going to be hooked up to internet. Uh, so we're still waiting. We've heard from the province uh, or, or somebody from the government, one of the governments uh, about five years ago, oh yeah, we forgot. We, well, we haven't forgot. You're still on the list. Um, so uh, I have, I'm in a community that we just got hooked up to the grid 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Uh, we have no telephones. Um, and uh, many of our community members paid the high prices for the unreliable ExploreNet. Uh, we just recently uh, looked at uh, um, Starlink. So we're, we're We've been hooking that up, and, and these are coming at high cost, and these are some things that uh, band members can't afford, these, uh, these systems. And they're still waiting for the hookup to um, the internet. Um, the other one is uh, the Olympics are back on the table again. Uh, going into the 2010 Olympics, uh, there was an announcement that uh, there will be a secondary access route uh, for the Olympics uh, that would run up Harrison Lake and up into Pemberton. Um, so we we prepared for that. We actually built a gas station. And uh, the highway didn't happen. The road didn't happen. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, that's vital to economic development, not for just my community, but uh, uh, many parts of uh, uh, Sea to Sky is uh, have that road open, whether it be a, a paved highway or a three-season road, create that access. Um, you know, we spend a half a million dollars building a gas station, and then we have no road. Um, and these there, like, a, our road is a logging road. I live at 80 kilometers down a, at the end of a logging road, uh, an unmaintained logging road. Um, so this would, uh, not only would it uh, increase the economic development, it would give us proper access. You know, we just came off a stint where there's, uh, we had no access uh, after the November events. Uh, one road is still closed. They don't anticipate that opening till spring. Um, we went through a couple of months using the secondary access into our community. Um, emergency vehicles couldn't get down there. Um, delivery trucks were taking out oil pans, but uh, I think in, in regards to economic development, uh, that with the upcoming the, or the anticipation of uh, another Olympics coming into Whistler, Vancouver Whistler, is that we there needs to be focus on that uh, secondary access. Um, and anybody that drives a Sea to Sky today, on any given day, there's delays, accidents. Uh, uh, since the Olympics, that road has been so packed. Um, like, uh, you get lineups from um, Horseshoe Bay to Squamish. That's how long the lineups are some days going into the Sea to Sky Highway. So, so I just wanted to raise those two things. One is the internet access, and one is uh, um, the secondary access route into the, uh, with, with, the, with the potential Olymp Olympics back on the table. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Chief. Um, the um, first piece on the connectivity piece, and our regional chief, uh, TG, highlighted this as well, with the um, additional $800 million that we have now for expanding connectivity opportunities. I think that one of the, I guess, frustrations we've had in the past was um, uh, often the line would get close to a community and then they wouldn't actually get it all the way to people's homes. Uh, and partly it was because of the arrangement we had made uh, with the companies where they decided where they thought that the most uh, opportunity was. But now that we've got the dollars in place, the conversations are happening not as a where would you like to go, but where we would like you to go. Uh, so the conversation has shifted. Uh, and I think uh, after uh, I leave, I'll come chat with you because we can connect you with um, uh, your, your team, with uh, some of the folks that are having those conversations about how do we get that last mile of connection right into communities, right into homes, because um, it's uh, no... 
no value to any community if if the line is coming close to the community uh, until it's connected to housing um, it's it's not beneficial to anyone so that is a conversation that's uh, very alive now uh, and I can move that uh, forward after this conversation um, as for the logging road, uh, of course, uh, if uh, the conversations are early around the Olympics, um, and uh, I know there's a lot of work still being done on the business case, and uh, and certainly um, uh, the the folks that are working on this proposal, I think that would be a good place for that conversation to happen as well. Uh, and I can get our teams to connect with Ministry of Transportation uh, and yourself and the Olympic bid folks uh, to have that conversation. Thank you so very much. I'm going to acknowledge that I have um, microphone 25, 13, and 12. I am going to cut off the speakers list there, but what I have done is I have reached out to um, executive assistant to the minister, Kieran, and she's provided some business cards. They'll also be in the back of the room for a little bit, so for any follow-ups on immediate concerns, uh, she'll make sure that you'll be able to connect with the minister and express those concerns. So thank you very much for that. So we're going to go over to microphone 25, followed by 13 and 12, and that will wrap up our speakers list on this topic. 25, please. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Minister. And thank you this morning for the good words from our respected knowledge keepers to start us off in a good way. Chief James Hobart, Spuzzum First Nation, Hazum and Quenchton is my traditional name. Wanted to thank you, Terry, uh, uh, Regional Chief, for uh, alluding and uh, mentioning the, the work I'm doing with the, the UHF spectrum. I don't, I don't know if people understand. The UHF spectrum is still alive and well. It was what they used to use those old aluminum antennas to watch Bonanza to come and clear, you know, and get out there and turn the, turn the antenna on that big old stump. Well, it's still there, and it's actually being bumped up to 5G. And at the same time, the government is saying it's obsolete. It's being bumped up to 5G as a 5G network source. It's a, it's a source that's over First Nations uh, territories, unceded territories, and they're making decisions on it. They're auctioning it off, and we're not at the table. First Nations are not at the table, and I'm confused about that. This is something that is over our heads. It's a resource that in other countries, they're making money, marketing it to the neighbors, to the neighboring communities. It is one of the fastest internet sources there is. You can get telephone, TV, and, uh, and uh, internet through the 5G network, I mean, through the 5G RRSB network. The telcos are the issue. They're, they're standing in front of the government saying, don't release it to the First Nations. Now, I'm saying that there needs to be a Canada-wide voice from the First Nations. I already have 200 and something uh, com uh, community signing on to supporting this, and 62 are right from here in BC. I need, we need to have more because it's not about one company getting better, not about any company being able to use it. It's about us being able to understand that we have this resource and that we can do what we can to, to utilize it. Right now, there is high-speed back-and-forth internet on being used on it. In certain communities, we have a four-community four pilot project that's going ahead, and unfortunately, it's not in BC, but it's going to be one that's going to show people the benefits of it at tenth of the cost of any of the others, and and uh, I know that uh, Chief Don Harris, when you guys were in your their biggest discussions, you had an office in in uh, down below because there was no internet. Can you imagine within months, like the, they could be having connectivity? Anybody, Iskut, Telegraph Creek, it's there. It's the same place that where we used. To, I used to live in Telegraph. We had TV there. There's no reason this can't be there. It shoots through trees, smoke, hills. It's faster, and, and yet the, the, the ICED is keeping it from being released to the First Nations. They're saying it needs to uh, go through the different processes, and all it is is one, I'm saying, if we're trying to deal with the First Nations freshwater issue, that's infrastructure that needs to be changed. This is already there. All it needs is a, is a, is a signatory to change some of the permitting to allow First Nations the ability to use some, a resource that's above our heads that's, it's already there. And so, actually, Minister, I'm asking for support as I go to the federal government. As the, We had way hot, farther inroads when uh, before Trudeau uh, won again and he shuffled his cabinet. We're way further inroads than we are right now with get the, getting this permitting. Somehow they uh, justified the last... Um, 
the last uh, uh, cabinet shuffle and we're starting all over again. And that's unfair to those First Nations. There was 11 that were waiting for this uh, service and now it's down to four because the telcos will go in and they'll sign on communities like yours. And they'll say, no, now we've retained you. Now you just wait in line. And we're hearing 2030 for some people to get connectivity. And I'd say it's wrong. I mean, imagine all of them, the, the post-secondary, all I, this, you guys can re create your own rationale and reasons why you need that there. It's there, it's available. Within months you can have it. The government is saying right now, and I'm, I'm gonna blame regulatory capture from the, from the major uh, telcos, they're saying don't release it because they understand that they wanna figure out how to utilize it first before they, they start to, to auction it off. But I'm saying that First Nations need to be at the table because right now they're rewriting some of the permitting structure of a resource that's available to us. And I'm really frustrated, and it's not, they're saying, well, we'll give you the white space. White space is not what we're after. We're after, uh, it was called the RRBS uh, spectrum space, and I'm coining it myself, to, I call it red space, because that's what we need. That you can, prompt, pr you can get 500 uh, watts of power out of it. The white space is 10. Chief, so Chief so I, know, I know, I'm almost done here. So I'm asking for support for this and I would really hopefully that we can get a letter of support that we can utilize and this is uh, this is huge because all of the First Nations could be connected if we can get this uh, pushed ahead because it is there it's above our heads Thank and you. we need it free, freed up Cook's Gem. And just uh, I, in wanting to get your point across I just want to acknowledge that was Chief James Hobart of Spasm First Nation I appreciate that and just kindly remind everybody to please identify yourself to our note taker for uh, and also to our speakers so that they know who they're addressing and who they're following up with. So again, thank you for that. Um, we're gonna go back over to the Minister. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Chief. Um, uh, I wasn't aware of, uh, of uh, this issue and how you're taking it to the federal government. Uh, um, I'm, I'm keen to learn more, and so perhaps uh, I'll come visit you right after this to, to learn more. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we'll go over to microphone number 13, and then we're gonna wrap up with microphone number 12. Good morning. Good morning. Police Band, Chief's Quarter Band. Uh, I think this is the first time I'm, I'm meeting you, Minister, and welcome to our meeting, and thanks for being here to present to us. Um, I guess I'd like to, for, my first question is, is what is, in your ministry, what are you doing in, in regards to uh, DRIPA on the provincial side? That's my first question. My second question is, are you willing to make a commitment to come to the Nicola Valley and, and meet with uh, us five chiefs in regards to economic development and the Gateway 286 project? Uh, we would like to seriously sit down and talk with you on, on how we can move forward in regards to Gateway. So short, simple, and fast. Appreciated given our schedule today. I will go back to microphone number two and the minister. Thank you so much. Um, on the second question, yes. Uh, and so perhaps we can uh, start looking at a time for me to come visit. Um, and uh, on the first question, uh, the, the, there's three things that uh, have a particular focus on for our ministry and the work we're doing. Uh, first and foremost is uh, a point that Regional Chief TG made is how do we ensure that uh, during economic recovery time, uh, that um, those that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic and all the other impacts uh, actually participate in the recovery. And so two pieces I think that are uh, critical. One is uh, working on a, a center of excellence for economic development uh, led by indigenous communities. And that work has been going on very well uh, and progressing. And, uh, and, and, the, and the second is looking at um, working with indigenous communities on uh, how we can, how we track the economy, how we actually evaluate whether um, the programs and things that we're doing are actually benefiting uh, First Nations uh, economies as First Nations see them. And so uh, working on uh, maybe a new model uh, at tracking and looking at uh, uh, well-being. And uh, Chief, Regional Chief TG already highlighted that in his, in his opening remarks and, uh, and, uh, and those are two of the main focuses for us. But the overarching one is how we can get per 
uh, greater participation from First Nations communities in uh, what we see as emerging sectors and not just in sectors that um, have been there for, for many years. We'll now turn to our final speaker on the list. Um, microphone number 12, please. Harvey McLeod, Chief for Upper Nicola. Welcome, Minister. I have printed out a copy of correspondence that I've submitted to Premier Horgan and to Minister Rankin. We need help. We need to have a meeting about a major project that's happening in Upper Nicola. We are at a stage right now where we have to make some decisions. Are we going to, what are we going to do next? The province was involved in the initial work. Um, we've involved the federal government. Um, we've involved Canada Infrastructure Bank. They're ready to go. And then the province stopped. So we need to have a meeting with you or somebody within uh, the provincial government to have discussions and see how we can make this project work. We have to continue. We're not going to stop. Um, Canada Infrastructure Bank was going to reach out to the province and see if there's some way, somehow, they can be involved in the work that we're planning. And we really need to meet really, really soon. So I'll give you a copy of the correspondence that I've sent and looking forward to have a meeting with somebody within the government to see how we can resolve the issues that we're having on support from the province. So with that, White Limlin, thank you. Uh, thank you so thank you so much chief um, i would say that um uh if uh, if you'd like to have a discussion in a in a faster way perhaps in the coming weeks we can do a virtual meeting because that way we can schedule it faster um and uh, and i can get a better sense of uh, the proposal. Unfortunately, I don't. I don't know the proposal that you're speaking of. Um, it's likely that it's with Ministry of Transportation, um, or uh, you're shaking your head. Another ministry. So perhaps uh, as I leave here, you can uh, share with me on which ministries you're working with, and uh, and I'll take it back. Thank you so very much to uh, Re Regional Chief TG and to Minister Scallon for joining us today. As we mentioned, um, both the Minister and his staff or executive assistant will be here. Maureen also has some of her cards, so if by chance you miss that quick connect in exchange for follow-up, Maureen does have some additional cards of hers, and we can also share that privately for anyone who um, asks for that on the chat online. Thank you so very much. We really appreciate you taking the time. We're going to continue on with our agenda because it's full, and I um, appreciate those of you who are able to get to your, your, your points. I also understand other times it takes a bit to get somewhere to explain uh, what's going on for us to understand. We're going to go now over to resolution number nine, the resolution um, It's the next one in line. And uh, draft resolution nine is uh, uh, there was a previous standing protocol, and this is updated to reflect the UNDRIP. So you have seen something that's a number of years ago, and it is support for the First Nations Leadership Council public safety protocol with the RCMP. I have, um, as you see on the motion, it has been moved by Chief Jerry Jack, and then the seconder has, I've just been informed of the seconder, uh, Chief Harvey McLeod. Um, and I also understand that there has been discussion between the mover and the seconder on some friendly amendments. So I'm going to read into the record those friendly amendments that were provided. Um, and I understand these friendly amendments came from Chief Harvey McLeod, and there was an agreement with the mover, uh, Chief Jerry Jack. So Chief Jerry Jack, if I could just get a nod that that did indeed happen. Thank you. So I'm just going to expedite into this. So when you look at this um, uh, in the whereas, A and B remains the same. And then uh, onward, I'm going to re read the remainder of the changes. So in the whereas, A, about public safety continues, remains the same. B, the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People and the articles involved remains the same. But now we have changes all the way through to the remainder of the document. Not every single part, but I am going to read those changes into the record. So under the whereas part, the new part C, the for BC First Nations Justice Strategy, in brackets 2020, in particular Strategy 22, mandates the BC First Nations Justice Council to establish new models of structured relations between First Nations, the RCMP, and other police forces, including the creation of protocols. D. The BC Assembly of First Nations, Union of BC Indian Chiefs, and First Nations Summit, working together as a First Nations Leadership Council, 
um, has developed in collaboration with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, RCMP, and the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs of Police, a draft cooperation protocol which aims to create a path forward that respects and recognizes the human rights of Indigenous people. And D, there's just a small change where um, the BC First Nations Justice Council has been struck, so it reads as, the draft public safety protocol between the First Nations Leadership Council and the RCMP and the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs of Police have been established to have been developed to establish a process for joint dialogue, action, and cooperation on promoting safe and resilient First Nations communities. Under the therefore be it resolved, as I always do, I'm going to read into the record, but I will just also note where the couple of changes are. So there's a little addition to one, there's a whole brand new three, and the previous three has been bumped down to four. So that's where you're going to see those changes. So in the therefore be it resolved, therefore be it resolved that the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to sign the draft cooperation protocol between the BC Assembly of First Nations, Union of BC and the Chiefs, and First Nations Summit, working collectively at the First Nations Leadership Council, the BC First Nations Justice Council, and the RCMP, and the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs. Two, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to clearly articulate to the RCMP and the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs BC Association of Municipal Chiefs that the cooperation protocol is not a substitute for the RCMP or the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs to engage directly with nations regarding the ground support and is not a delegation of authority in any way. Three, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to support the BC First Nations Justice Council in implementing Strategy 22 of the BC First Nations Justice Strategy, including the creation of additional protocols with other police services, police service agencies with in, pardon me, in BC and work with the BC First Nations Justice Council to ensure the inclusion and involvement of the BC First Nations Justice Council in the adoption of the RCMP safety protocol. And four, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly fully support and endorse the renewal of the public safety cooperation protocol between the First Nations Leadership Council and the RCMP and BC Association Municipal Chiefs uh, for the next three years. So we'll go first to the mover and then to the seconder. So we'll go over to microphone number 18. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just wondering if these are really sticky because it says municipal chiefs. It does. The, it should say police chiefs, I think. Uh, at what point are you looking at all the way across the board or is it one particular spot? I, doubt, um, I can't see what you're looking at. Um, on I'm just, when, wherever when it says municipal chiefs, yeah, there's a lot of noise at the front and the back. I'm having a hard time, folks. I got day three head, so please help your chair out. Thank you so much. Back to you. I'm just wondering if it should say municipal police chiefs instead of just chiefs, because uh, some people might wonder what they're talking about. Okay, go ahead and move forward. Just, the, just that, that's all. Well, you're moving it, so we, we're happy to make those changes. We'll check in with our second or wherever. Where did you just go? Oh, there he is. Uh, Chief Harvey McLeod. Um, there was one small friendly amendment to the friendly amendment. Uh, did you hear that? And, uh, and yes, yes, I did. And Great. Great. And you have it. Um, can you just specify where that is? Microphone five, please. I have the changes um, in, therefore be it resolved that in number one, in the, it's BC Association of Municipal Chiefs of Police, as well as in, therefore be it resolved number two, um, it's, I've included the BC Association of Municipal Chiefs of Police. So there's, um, in, Therefore, be it resolved number one and number two, the addition, just to clarify that it's municipal chiefs of police. Thank you. Oh, I, I heard the cook's jam, but we didn't have the microphone, but thank you so much. So we have that. We're good with the mover, the seconder. 
Uh, would you would you like to speak to the uh, proposal? You're good. Uh, going to our seconder, would you like to speak to the propo uh, the uh, resolution? Uh, Chief Harvey McLeod, would you like to speak to the resolution? Number 12, please. It was good to hear the and listen to the commissioner this morning. And the discussions that I had with them after is that this is the first step in the process of us developing a relationship with who I call the cops. And that's who they are still today. They're still cops to me. And there's still a relationship that needs to be built around trust. And especially seeing the day and age that we're in right now, so much is happening in community, so much is happening with individuals and, and families. And our safety is at the top of the chain of what we need to provide for our, for our citizens. So yes, let's develop them protocols and understanding right from the, the office staff, the clerks, the constables, the sergeants, um, the commissioner, um, and the solicitor generals for both British Columbia and Canada. Lametti has to be involved in this as well because there is a lot of work that needs to happen in understanding about who we are and how we can better provide and services and, and ensure our people are safe when it comes to just being outside, walking down the street, or if they run into complications with the justice system. And finally, it's where it's going to be going, the justice system. We really need to be right, rewriting them laws that guide and govern um, agencies like the RCMP and police forces. So with that, White Limland. Thank you very much. From our mover and our seconder, I'm now going to open the floor for discussion on draft resolution nine with those friendly amendments added in. Support for the First Nations Leadership Council public safety protocol with the RCMP. The floor is open both here in the room as well as online. <laughs> Question has been called. Okay, uh, is there any abstentions to draft resolution number nine? Seeing none, looking to Maureen. Any opposition to draft resolution number nine? Maureen? We're good. So with your permission, I declare it passed by consensus. Thank you very much. Now I am delighted to call up with it. Look at that. Woohoo! Thank you so much for being ready for me. We're going to have a water update from Chief Harvey McLeod and BCAFM water coordinator Sophie Eliopoulos. And if I said that wrong, I welcome you to correct me. So the floor is yours on microphone number two, Chief uh, Harvey McLeod. Again, why Kashkal Halte Peace Nixil in a language that means good day, my friends and relatives. It's an honor to be sitting here and sharing with you some of the work that has been happening behind the scenes in regards to water. It is one of the most sacred items and, and gifts that we have from Creator, water. And at one time, I didn't think I'd ever have to talk about water and its use. Growing up on the res, getting a bucket of water out of the creek was, was normal. Washing the clothes, cooking the food, cleaning ourselves. But over the last few decades, that has changed. I thought it was crazy one time when I had seen this company selling bottled water. I thought, how crazy is that? But now it's a norm. And as we move forward and develop a new relationship with the colonial governments, we have to get involved and start discussing its use and who authorizes the use of water. So today we'll be um, introducing the first step on uh, the discussions that we need to have with, uh, with uh, the province. So with that, White Limited, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll go over to microphone number three for Sophia. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you to everybody here today, um, acknowledging Musqueam um, for us to be able to reside on their territories. And thank you to Dr. Point um, for the beautiful prayer this morning. My name is Sophia Iliopoulos, and I'm the Regional Water Coordinator at the BC Assembly of First Nations. Um, and today, do we have the presentation up? We do. Yeah, I got the clicker. Thank you. 
Um, so today we're just going to run you through a quick presentation. Um, so since time immemorial, First Nations have been the caretakers and stewards of our waters of what is now known as British Columbia. Water governance and jurisdiction is a critical aspect of First Nations self-determination, nation rebuilding and sovereignty. Despite colonial attempts to take control over waters in BC, First Nations continue to lead water governance and jurisdictional initiatives on their traditional territories for the benefit of present and future generations. The First Nations Leadership Council has published a draft intentions paper, which is included in your kits today, exploring what water revenue sharing might look like with First Nations in BC, what it could support, and why it should be prioritized. Today, Chief Harvey and I are presenting the key, key components of the paper and are seeking a mandate to, uh, and support through Resolution 10 2022 from the Chiefs in Assembly to advance this work. So, a little bit of context on the paper. Uh, in British Columbia, nearly 50,000 licenses permit the use of surface and groundwater and are regulated under the Water Sustainability Act. These licenses include municipalities regional districts, agricultural growers and processors, industrial users such as power, oil and gas, mining and manufacturing. These water users are required to apply for a water license and must pay annual water rental fees that range between $250 and $10,000 uh, for their, um, sorry, $250 to $10,000 for their application and then annual water rental fees. Water license rentals generate over $400 million annually in BC. Nearly one quarter of all natural resources revenues generated by the province. Except for a very small percentage of revenue associated with private run of the river hydroelectric power projects, none of this revenue is currently shared with First Nations rights and title holders. The First Nations Leadership Council has received several mandates to advocate for water license rental revenue sharing with First Nations in BC from the Chiefs and Assembly, including but not limited to the First Nations Leadership Council, First Nations Water Rights Strategy, which was published in 2013. Furthermore, Action 1.5 in BC's Declaration Action, Action Plan, Declaration Action, <laughs> sorry, Declaration Act Action Plan commits BC to co-develop and implement new distinctions-based policy frameworks for resource revenue sharing and other fiscal mechanisms with Indigenous peoples. For First Nations, water is a sacred being that is integral to ceremony, healing, and human sustenance. The BC government's continued commodification of water threatens First Nations' inherent constitutionally protected and treaty rights to water. First Nations in BC have inherent jurisdiction over water and any revenues generated from the commodification of water must be shared with rights and title holders in alignment with the UN Declaration. As the BC provincial government works with First Nations to implement the Declaration Act, recognition of First Nations jurisdictional water rights must be upheld and shared decision-making frameworks must be central to the work ahead. Since colonization began, the BC government has enabled the extraction and diversion of fresh water in First Nations traditional territories throughout the province without achieving free, prior, and informed consent. Sharing water license rental revenues with First Nations wouldn't achieve free, prior, and informed consent for BC's current water licensing and pricing regime. Instead, water license rental revenue sharing with rights and title holders would recognize the privilege of accessing and using water on First Nations traditional lands. A bit more background on BC's current water licensing structure. In BC, all non-domestic users of fresh water, which includes surface water as well as groundwater, are required to obtain a water license from the BC government. Similar to other natural resources such as timber, water license holders are required to pay a one-time application fee, which I mentioned was between $250 to $10,000, as well as annual rental fees to divert and or use that water, which is allocated through their licenses. This rental fee structure has been in, enacted for surface water since the 1920s and for groundwater since, since 2016. As mentioned earlier, BC receives over $400 million annually in revenue from water license fees. Hydropower producers account for approximately 95% of this. The remaining 5% is derived from a broad, a broad range of water uses including crop irrigation, livestock watering, municipal drinking water, pulp and paper, water bottling, mining, oil and gas, as well as manufacturing and processing. 
Water license rental rates depend on the type of water used and the quantity of water that's been authorized. But the maximum amount that is charged to any water user in BC is $2.25 per thousand meter cube. That's the equivalent to 2,500 milliliter water bottles, uh, which are produced throughout BC. Many water users pay considerably less than this amount. And despite the BC government's introduction of, introduction of new rates in 2015, the province is still one of the amongst the lowest water license rental rates across Canada, which fails to cover the costs of administering and managing water licenses in BC. At the direction of First Nations leadership through the BC AFN, First Nations Summit, and Union of BC Indian Chief Mandates, water rental rates should be reevaluated as a component of water revenue sharing discussions with rights and title holders in the BC government. So this particular paper that I mentioned is um, in your packages explores what um, water revenue sharing models could look like. And so we explored some potentials that are um, uh, located in Appendix A to give you some more context. But just to give you a, a brief overview of what that could look like, um, this is based off of a uh, BC AFN resolution that came in 2011, which called on BC to share water license rentals equally with First Nations. So through that context, that would be about $200 million a year for rights and title holders. So a range of options exist, and this can include by territory, so individual revenue sharing agreements that could be made with First Nations whose territories are directly impacted by water extraction. It could also be by watershed because it's difficult to quantify the cumulative effects of water withdrawals. So it could be um, arranged by a watershed um, sort of um, a watershed based forum that allows First Nations within the watershed to share those revenues. It could also be done through a centralized provincial wide uh, funding mechanism. So the entirety of the 200 million could go into a fund that distributes to First Nations. It could also be a hybrid of the, the above. So as I mentioned, Appendix A explores this a little bit more in depth, and we're hoping to have these discussions in the future um, with the, the mandate that we're hoping to um, have passed today. Just a quick note on precedents. There has been some precedents set for First Nations to uh, have these discussions. That includes the First Nations Clean Energy Business Fund, which was enacted in 2010 uh, as part of BC's Clean Energy Act. Um, this is an existing precedent where water revenue sharing has been enabled through independent run of river hydroelectric power projects. Uh, and this generates between 7 million and 9 million annually for impacted First Nations. There's also the BC Gaming Revenue Sharing Limited Partnership, which was enacted in 2019. Um, and this is uh, not based on territori territorial impacts, uh, but it does allocate 7% of all gaming revenues to BC First Nations. Um, through the entity. And finally, the forest revenue sharing, um, which has uh, been evolving, but in 2022, uh, the BC government announced doubling forest revenue rates for First Nations in BC. So as I mentioned, your package uh, includes a resolution, 10-2022, that recommends um, uh, some following actions for the First Nations Leadership Council to undertake. Central to the Declaration Act and subsequent action plan, a new relationship that is based on shared decision making, recognition and honoring of Indigenous rights, including but not limited to inherent jurisdictional water rights should be at the forefront of discussions. Revenue sharing of water license rentals between BC and First Nations rights and title holders is long overdue and there's a significant opportunity to support the implementation of the Declaration Act action plan through this work. Revenue sharing of water license rentals is a significant step towards recognizing the impacts of water use and diversion to First Nations territories and on Aboriginal title and rights as a result of water use and diversion. More importantly, it's a key opportunity to advance discussions with BC regarding true shared decision making of our most vital resource. So the FNLC seeks to undertake the following steps as part of a coordinated approach to engage with the BC government on this issue. One. Call for, for, call for full recognition of First Nations jurisdictional water rights, including amendments of provincial policies, regulations, and legislation that should support shared decision making regarding the use and management of water in BC. Two, initiate and formalize discussions with the BC government on water license rentals revenue sharing with First Nations. Three, advocate for the prioritization of water license rental revenue sharing under BC's Declaration Act action plan. Four, advocate for water revenue rental sharing frameworks to be meaningfully co-developed with First Nations rights and title holders. Five, 
call for dedicated capacity funding for the FNLC to support discussions with First Nations on BC, in BC on water revenue sharing frameworks, including determining options for distributing revenues. And six, initiate discussions with the BC government to increase water license rental rates to levels that both reflect the true administrative, ecological, and restorative costs associated with water use, and encourage water users, users to maximize efficiency and conservation. This would include a full regular review of water license rental rates every three to five years with rights, rights and title holders, including any exemptions. In your resolution package, as I mentioned, there's resolution 10 2022, which seeks a mandate from the chiefs and assembly to undertake these important steps. Thank you. Thank you very much, both to Chief Harvey McLeod, as well as to uh, Sophia, the um, BCFM water coordinator. As mentioned, thank you for making my job easy. We're gonna now go to draft resolution number 10, uh, call to prioritize water sharing frameworks under BC's um, Declaration Act Action Plan. That is a bit of a stumble. Declaration Act Action Plan. <laughs> and this is, I, I already noted on your draft resolution, is moved by Chief Harvey McLeod, Upper Nicola. And the seconder is Chief Stuart Jackson of the Lower Nicola Band. Um, I'm gonna just turn to our mover, Chief Harvey McLeod. Um, and seconder there, making sure you're both here. And you just go into the uh, therefore be it resolved. You've had a, a whole presentation on the preamble to this. So we're gonna go into the therefore be it resolved. Therefore be it resolved that the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly support and endorse the FNLC's water revenue sharing on water licenses in British Columbia discussion paper as a mechanism and framework to initiate discussions with First Nations and BC on water revenue sharing. Two. The BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to call on BC to recognize and honour First Nations jurisdictional water rights and amend provincial policies, regulation and legislation that support shared decision making regarding the use and management of water. Three, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief and the BC AFN staff to engage with and call on the provincial government to A, initiate and formalize discussions with BC on water revenue sharing with First Nations. B, advocate for the prioritization of water revenue sharing under BC's Declaration Act Action Plan. C, advocate for water revenue sharing frameworks to be meaningfully co-developed with First Nations rights and title holders. D, call for dedicated capacity funding for the FNLC to support dis discussions with First Nations in BC on water revenue sharing frameworks, including determining options for distributing revenues. E, initiate discussion with the BC government to increase water license rental rates to levels that both reflect the true administrative, ecological and restorative costs associated with water use and encourage water users to maximize efficiency and conservation include a regular review of water license rental rates every three to five years with rights and title holders, including any exemptions. I believe that is the end. Yes, it is. And so I will turn to our mover, Chief Harvey McLeod, if you have any further comment this time. Microphone number two, please. Thank you. In putting together the discussions and the paper today for review by the chiefs of British Columbia, some of the earlier discussions revolved around jurisdiction. The pinnacle of colonization in this province was based on land, land rights, and of course, water rights. And they were discussions that we were excluded to participate in as people. And now it's time to reflect and make change to that. Put us back in our rightful place that yes, we have jurisdiction on our lands, and yes, we have jurisdiction on our water. This is the first step in that process. And we must never forget that when it comes to revenue sharing, it's good that we can discuss that, and it's on the table. But at the same time, we continue the discussions around jurisdiction on lands and on the water. A lot of probably 100% of the surface water is already given away in rights. And now we're looking at the subsurface asset water. Where is that at? And that's being eyed right now. And we as leaders in this province have had some discussions with, with companies that are wanting to access 
the in-ground water. So it's still there yet. And we have to keep in mind that water isn't a commodity. It isn't something to be bought and sold. It is something to be taken care of. And with us getting involved with this uh, water revenue sharing uh, presentation today, but at the same time continuing on a discussion on jurisdiction, that's where the real work needs to happen. So with that, um, we're looking for your support and discussion on this resolution. So with that, Wai Limlin, thank you. Thank you, Chief Harvey McLeod. We'll go over to Chief Stuart Jackson, the seconder uh, from the Lower Nicola Band. Uh, microphone 13. Yeah, Diction 1-1 one, one, uh, uh, in Squatch 2 Jackson, Cook B, the Lower Nicola Indian Band. I'm not gonna take too much time. I think that um, the, the resolution speaks for itself. Um, I think one of the things that's really important is that our, um, when we take a look at our provincial landscape, um, it's very different from the north to the south, east and west, and our watersheds and our water systems are very different, they're very unique. And um, what may be a pressing matter for some nations may not be for others. But I think if we can look at an, a, a seamless, uh, um, I guess, approach um, and recognize and acknowledging um, the pressing matters of our water shortages that many of our nations face. Um, and, uh, and protecting that natural resource um, and uh, uh, you know, keeping in mind you know, what our responsibilities are as leaders in our, in our nations and this very, very valuable uh, resource that we depend on. We, it's not just the indigenous communities that depend on water. We all depend on the water. And one of the things that um, is very, very dear to my heart and part of my commitment as Cookby in my, in my community is, is drought. And the drought that we, we are faced with and we're subjected to um, in, our, in our community, in our valley. And uh, this is not, uh, um, it's something that's very, very serious. And one of the things that I think about, and I'll, I'll just share with some of you, I don't know what you do in the mornings when you brush your teeth. You know, this might be a, a silly analogy, but it's real, very real. When I brush my teeth, I turn the water on just for a second, just to wet the toothpaste. And then you know what I do? I turn the tap off. How many people do that? How many people look at our water um, situation and really look deep into the fact that um, the taps will dry out one day. They can and they will. So we have a responsibility. Um, it's not about um, making money off of this. I think one of the things is just restoring and sustaining something that we all depend on and something that, um, I mean, it's maybe it's a cliche, but it's a fact, water is life. And uh, if we don't have it, if we don't take care of it, if we don't manage and foster what we have and do it properly, um, then uh, we're definitely, uh, we'll put ourselves in a very compromised situation. So um, I think I said, I said earlier, this, this, this motion speaks for itself. I think there's more underlying uh, work and efforts that we have to undertake as we move forward with this. I hope the chiefs will support this and um, you know, realize, you know, that this is as, as simple as it may sound, this is a bigger, a, a bigger situation that, um, that we have a full responsibility to, to take care of. So with that quick step. Thank you. Uh, we will uh, now open the floor for discussion. I've had uh, two hands go up, three hands go up, four hands. So I'm just, uh, the ones that hands just popped up. I had a couple before you, so I had 19, 10, and there was one more I saw, 21, and 20, okay. So thank you very much. We have quite a speaker's list on this one for the discussion. We'll go first over to 13. So we'll go 13, 25, 19, 12, 21, and 20. I do have that, but I'm just letting you know we're gonna be bopping around. So over to 13 and nine. Thank you. Uh, Lee Spahan, Chief's Quarter Band. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Chief Harvey and Chief Stu for putting this resolution forward. Um, just wondering if we would entertain a friendly amendment to 
The second, therefore, um, right after it says uh, First Nations jurisdictional water rights and Indigenous laws. Um, I raised this issue so I know in Coal Water we do have a water stewardship uh, plan and act in place, and, and that's uh, the recommendation is to add Indigenous laws in there. So I'm just wondering if the chiefs would entertain that. And yes, water is life and water is sacred. Gukstam. Thank you. I was able to spot that easily. So again, that friendly amendment is right on the tail end or in the middle of that first sentence of section two, therefore be it resolved. So it just reads, um, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the regional chief to call on BC to recognize and honor First Nations jurisdictional water rights and indigenous laws as the amended uh, friendly amendment and amend provincial policies. The rest remains the same. So I'm gonna go over to, I saw thumbs up from our mover, a seconder, thumbs up as well. So great. And I know that got captured because if I could capture it, Maureen was way on top of it. Um, we'll go over to microphone number 25, please. Thank you. And th thanks for the presentation. And thank you for moving this and uh, seconding it. I'm, I don't see any mechanism for uh, water being returned. And uh, the reason why I'm saying that is I know in, uh, in Chief Jackson's nation, there's a mine that is going through trying to return a million dollars, a million gallons Per, uh, per month, I think, and they're saying that they need to spend money to do a study on order to return the water to the system. And I think that that's important that we, that sure, we're talking about extraction, but there are companies that are wanting to return it and they're not allowed to unless they do a full fledged study on what that water looks like going back into the system. I just wondered if there was some way we can include that. Kukshtam. So just for the record, that's uh, Chief James Stewart, uh, pardon me, Hobart of Spuzzum. I just kindly remind everybody, please identify yourself for our note taker. I know we're on day three. We know who you are. She's got her head down, making sure she's doing a good job. We want to help her out. Sorry. So um, sound like there was a suggestion there, but I didn't hear a friendly amendment. I'm just going to... There was a suggestion made. It was not clarified as a friendly amendment. I'm not sure where to go with that right now. So... I'm going to go back to you, uh, to Chief Hobart, just to clarify, because I heard a suggestion, but not. I, I think what I was speaking about was an amendment for uh, access uh, for uh, the communities to be able to engage on those that want to return water to the system, because I don't see that in there. And I think that that's huge, because if the government is sitting there putting a process in front of somebody that wants to put water back, that we need to be at that table and have that discussion. So I, I don't. I don't know where, how that would fit in, maybe the wording around, and I, sorry, I'd, I was, I was re busy writing, but I didn't get it all down to, to, to uh, somehow include First Nations in the discussions around um, returning water that's already been permitted as being, uh, you know, utilized every year. If they want to turn, return it back, to have some sort of a place at the table for the First Nations to be there as well. And I know that we're talking about permitting, taking it out, but it also, you know, if we do have somebody that wants to put it back in, we need to be able to be included in that conversation. So I don't know how the amendment might be worded. Um, if I'd have been given, if I'd have had more time, it just popped into my head when I heard my uh, Cook P. Uh, Jackson speaking about it. Anyway, that's just if it. Uh, I'm okay with the way it is. I just think that if that's not included in it, then it's it's we're missing out on ability to have that also uh, brought into the discussion when it comes to the resolution being presented as support uh, to the government around um, water being returned to the system. Kukshem. Thank you very much for those comments. I'm just looking to remove her. Uh, like you're in contemplation. Uh, microphone number two, please. Thank you, Chief. It is one of, I think, many discussions that we need to have as long as along with a number of other issues and comes to taking care of and managing the the uh, water. And I see it as um, an action item under the use and management of water under number two. Okay. But I think we can highlight it in there as one of the action items that we have to undertake and have some review on how we're going to move forward um, in the discussions in water management. So, Limnit. Thank you for that. appreciate that clarification. Uh, and now we're going to go over to microphone number 19, please. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Gisok Vishnam, Cheryl Kazmer, proxy for Akam. Um, speaking in favor of the resolution, I uh, just have a comment and a friendly amendment to um, propose. A couple of months ago, um, my well went, um, my pump broke in my well. And um, as, as it is with a lot of things that are happening within our um, respective communities um, due to the pandemic, it took quite some time before somebody could actually get to my house to repair that pump. And so I went eight days without water and it just made me realize how critical and important it is to be able to um, have access you know, to good drinking water and to um, not be able to turn on a tap and have it flow freely um, was really dis dis or it was concerning. So I know the importance of water, um, not to mention that when I was growing up, I think like, like many of you around this table, we had to use the outdoor pump and carry water into our home. So having had to do that as a, as a child, you also gain the respect um, for the importance of water. And so um, I, that, having said that, that's why I support this resolution. But one of the things that I wanted to share is that every time we use the term or this concept of us being able to manage a natural resource, it, it, it kind of concerns me because the only person or the only being or the only thing that can actually manage a natural resource is its creator. And I think that we, if, we, if we come from that perspective, then we are thinking of ourselves as being higher, a higher being than we actually really are. I think what we need to do is we need to think about what do we, how do we manage the human impacts to that natural resource. And when you think it, about it from that perspective, then it changes everything. So when we're talking about managing water, it's not necessarily managing that resource. It's about managing the human activity and the human impacts that are detrimental to our clean water supply. And so I think that it's really important for us to think about it from that perspective. In terms of um, my friendly amendment, I'm speaking to number two. And I think that even though the resolution is entitled, um, or the intent of the resolution is to prioritize water revenue sharing as per the DRIPA action plan, I still think that we need to make reference to the United Nations Declaration and to DRIPA itself. So I was just thinking under um, number two, where it says regarding the use and management of water as per the um, principles and standards set out in the United Nations Declaration and DRIPA if that could be considered. Um, further to that, in number three, another amendment. Just typing furiously over oh. here to my left, I appreciate it. You just wanna repeat your first friendly amendment just so make sure we got it. Okay. Is to uh, management of water as per the principles and standards set out in the United Nations Declaration as well as DRIPA. Yeah, okay, next okay. one please. And then in number three, I just wanted to, because um, I, I looked through the resolution and even though it is a leadership council um, initiative, there's nowhere in here where it's directing the BC regional chief or the assembly of, sorry, the BC regional chief to work with partners with the summit and the UBCIC. So I'm wondering if maybe it's in three where it would say that the BC AFN chiefs and assembly direct the regional chief. Um, and I guess, and BCFN staff to work with First Nations Summit, UBCIC, collectively known as the First Nations Leadership Council, to call on the provincial government to. Those are my friendly amendments. Thank you. Thank you. I think those are pretty clear. I saw a nod from remover. I'm going over to a seconder. I see a nod over there. Um, and you may have seen Maureen hopping over to our prior discussion on a suggestion about the water being returned. And we, there was a solution that came up and was provided as a proposed friendly amendment to include that more clearly. And so I'm just gonna to turn to Maureen to what you shared with um, Chief Hobart and then go to a mover and seconder on that. 
So there be a new addition, a number three, um, under therefore be it resolved that three, the BCFN Chiefs and Assembly to call on the BC government to ensure engagement with First Nations regarding the return of water resources back to the ecosystem. So that's what's been proposed. Uh, I think that's um, what you, you were driving at. Um, turning to a mover on that, see a nod. I'm turning to a seconder on that. Uh, Chief uh, Jackson, got a nod as well. Thank you very much. We'll now go to uh, microphone number 12 and just a gentle reminder. Oh. Uh, we will go back to microphone number 12. Um, was there a 12 or did I miss that? Sorry if I. Was it 10? Sorry. Sorry, I was writing fast. Thank you, my apologies to Chief Don Tom. We'll go over to microphone number 10. Um, then I go 25, 29, and do the Sayers online. So we'll go over microphone number 10, please. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Chief Don Tom, Sartlet First Nation, speaking in support of the resolution. Uh, just wanted to share the, some of the difficulties that we have in Sartlip. Um, we're not far from Victoria, and we, uh, we were able to get into the municipal water. And, um, but the, uh, the regional district is the one who owns the, the shed and decides on the, the pricing, and they give it to the municipality at a, at a lower cost and so that the municipality can uh, also generate revenue from that. And then uh, what we've been asking for is a, a price on water that would uh, maybe um, uh, I know that we're also surrounded by uh, farms in our area, and I know that the, the farmers get a cheaper water rate than we do in, in Sartlip. Um, so uh, just speaking in favor to this and knowing the, uh, uh, you know, I'm fortunate that we, we do have a hookup into uh, fresh water, and uh, we do have a few wells, but um, uh, mostly we're, we, we have uh, fresh running water. Um, and, uh, you know, I worry about what's happening in California and uh, everything is drying up. Uh, they're having to get water from other places. They're having to decide between what can, you know, what can we give water to agriculture or, um, and so I do worry about further down the road and I'm happy that this work is taking place. Uh, and lastly, I, I just want to, um, uh, recognizing the jurisdiction, but also uh, building on the, the words of my colleague, Cheryl Kazmier, of the relationship that we have with water. And uh, many of us at home, whether we go for early morning baths or we go to cleanse ourselves, the, the spiritual importance of our water and uh, the, the spiritual uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? Um, I can't think of it right now, but uh, the person who's taking notes, if you can put in something really impressive for me, please. <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll end there. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and my apologies uh, regarding speakers. I am doing my very best. I am very human on this part. There was a lot of hands shooting up. Um, so what I do have is next is microphone number 20, then nine, then uh, do the Sayers online, then 21. So uh, it was it 21 or 20? We can go to 21. I'm just looking, was it? Okay, thank you. Like I said, hands are shooting up all over the place and you like to pull them right down right away. So next time we'll make sure when there's a lot of uh, interest to dialogue that we have a staff person helping me out with that. So we'll go over to 21, please. Yeah, when you're calling them out, it was 21, then 20. Oh, okay. <clears throat> But uh, Chief Don Harris, Douglas First Nation, um, I've been raising this issue for quite a few years. The revenue share creates a lot of problems for us. There is a revenue sharing formula out there for the water, has been for a while. I have 11, I'm involved with 11 run of the river projects, two of them meet the revenue sharing criteria. When they ruled out the amendments to the Water Sustainability Act, I started raising this issue at the tables, both UBCIC and AFN, BCAFN. When they 
when they started uh, charging fees for groundwater in the amendments, the amended uh, Water Sustainability Act, that does open the door for revenue share. The current revenue share model does not work. It creates the overlap issues. For communities to claim revenue share, they have to claim territory. And I keep raising this overlap issue numerous times at all these tables. I have 10 communities from my neighboring nation that claim my territory. It affects my day-to-day -day operations of my community. I have to ask permission of people from the other territory to build my community. These are the kind of problems it creates. There was the ability to apply for funds out of uh, the clean energy pot, <clears throat> the clean energy fund. That formula was changed <clears throat> and it was representatives from the leadership tables that sat at the table to change that formula. It used to be one third for the government, one third um, for the First Nations and one third for the Clean Energy Fund. The Clean Energy Fund was negotiated down to 13 or, or half of the 33, so that lost that pot. To claim revenue share the way it, on the current model, you have to claim that territory. Like I said, we generate a lot of revenues for re the water revenue sharing fund. And it creates a lot of problems for us. I have to ask communities like Peters Reserve, Kwantlen, Katesey, Jailis, Seabird, all these communities and many more, I have to ask permission to work in my backyard because of these revenue sharing agreements. And I've been raising this for years, since they rolled out the Water Sustainability Act amendments, they're saying we need to change the formula for the revenue share. Eliminate the need to claim territory. Water is a very important uh, resource to us. But like the trees, the province is used now to separate us, to divide us, to take away our inherent rights by allowing others to claim your territory. And again, I raise this at numerous times at many different tables, so I strongly oppose this resolution at this time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go over to microphone number 20, then followed by nine, then online. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good day. You know, I was just uh, listening to this, and um, um, I like what this um, uh, Cheryl was saying here, I believe, about the sacredness of water. I think in this resolution, you know, I, I will... Um, I, I believe we must understand water is not a resource. We have to maintain that focus of water is sacred because without water we can't exist. I know we need revenue share within our nations. I know we need to protect the water. I just, I just really think I'm really struggling with this motion because once we say we're going to share revenues, let's not forget it's ours. We, we were, I, I like what one of our elders said this, they put us on the rocks and, rocks and hills. Now they want what we have on the rocks and hills. This motion, this revenue share, I tell you, my dear people, 
is going to forever change the future of our children. Look seven generations ahead. Look. It's going to be worth more later than now. Look up and hope here. Who do we have up there? Huh? They don't even have a revenue share agreement. They just profit. Think about that. They just profit. And we have chicken feed for chickens, as our elders would say. Without water, we cannot exist. We must treat it as sacred. I understand. I understand what my cook be here says. I understand what the AFN is doing, the First Nations Leadership Council, and whoever else. I know. I just, if I, if I could just suggest a change, I don't know if I'll support this motion, but I think what Cheryl was bringing up is correct. On the last, on the last one, E, I would add, after three to five years, with the title holders as a right within our natural laws. You cannot leave natural law out of water. You can't. You just can't. I don't care how high of chiefs we are when it comes to ceremony and on the land. You have to apply natural law. Otherwise, it bites us. That's all I can say, my dear people. Thank you for listening, but that's a recommended change that I would add and including any exemptions. Thank you. So just a, identifying uh, Chief Daryl Bob of Chachlip. Chief Daryl Bob Chachlip, sorry. Yeah, okay, so on uh, 3E at the very end, do um, you want to just read that in, please, Maureen? The last sentence. Yep. Um, include a regular review of water license rental rates every three to five years with title holders as a right within our natural laws, including any exemptions. I believe there was still rights and title holders there. Was it rights and title holders or are you removing the rights? No. We have to recognize the title okay. within our nations and not our right within our natural laws is what that means. Okay. And every nation has a natural law within their teachings. Thank you, so, so striking the rights. Thank you for that clarification. I will turn over to our mover. See a nod, yes. Going over to our seconder. See a nod, yes, as well. Thank you very much. We'll go now over to microphone number nine, please. Marianne Archie, Can Make Band Proxy. I have my tech, technical assistant, Don McGrath, doing some additional comments. Hi. Um, my background is in water, wastewater as an operator. And I see and I appreciate uh, Chief Harvey McLeod putting the resolution together. There's a lot of work that's gone into this. And with all respect, um, I just wanted to put some comments to the the Watershed Sustainability Act is separate from the Drinking Water Quality Act, and we don't have a Drinking Quality Water Act for Indigenous communities. It would be a recommendation to include that into this framework. The other thing that I'm looking at is it doesn't include the Crown Corporation users and the gross net profit that they make through their hydro projects as a specific line item. So I would recommend that we take a look. If you're talking about 
getting monies back into our communities to enhance the production, water quality, and our operation and maintenance of our systems and our watershed management, that those be tied into this particular resolution. Um, my third recommendation is that it doesn't inhibit or obstruct any other Indigenous community that may be undertaking this work through other processes. One example being the rights and title of the Chilcotin, and the second is through the treaty processes that are currently being negotiated. We don't want to infract or inhibit or you know, counteract any of those legislation pieces that have already been discussed. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you for that. There was recommendations there. I didn't hear it. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we'll go now online to uh, now uh, proxy Judith Sayers. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, Judith. I'm sorry I missed you earlier in the shoot up of hands. Um, and the floor is yours for comments or questions. Yes, and thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I haven't had an opportunity to read this paper on the water revenue sharing and water licenses in BC. <laughs> There's a lot of um, pre-work that needs to be done for these and I didn't have any notice on that. So I hope that we continue discussions on that paper. That's just a comment. I was just wondering uh, because, you know, like there's only this one paragraph on management of water. If we could strengthen the second paragraph um, that supports shared decision-making uh, and support sounds so to me kind of weak. Can we say that provides for shared decision-making? I would really, you know, because we are the title holders of water that we should be able to be saying who gets licenses, how it's managed, uh, you know, uh, one of the chiefs mentioned drought. We should be able to be able to say who gets priority for the water when there is a drought. I, I know we don't, we're not really involved in that. So I just really want to strengthen our ability to manage water. Um, and, you know, maybe we can amend the provincial policies, regulations and legislation. Um, but, you know, this has to be a main theme. So just a friendly amendment, uh, a minor one. Um, appreciate that revenue sharing is important to First Nation because it does show our title, but uh, we just need to strengthen that share, that support shared decision. Let's make it sure it's in the legislation that we have shared decision making. Thank you. So noting that in therefore be it resolved number two, the very last part, after regulation legislation that provides shared decision making regarding the use of managers. So striking support to provides. Um, just looking over to get a nod from our mover, going over to our seconder, getting a nod there as well. I'm just looking around to see if there's anybody else on the speakers list for draft resolution number 10, call to prioritize water revenue sharing framework under BC Declaration, BC's Declaration Act Action Plan. Seeing no need for further discussion, wondering if we can go to question at this time. Questions, comment or question, further discussion? Question. No, sorry, I, th there was a hand that went up just before you said that. 13? Just a comment um, in regards to uh, the recommendations from Speaker 9, can those be used as action items in regards to this? Action items to the amendment, action items to? To follow up with this resolution. Because they were very good recommendations. Sure. So, what is being suggested is to table the resolution and work on the uh, work on those additions, if that is amenable to our, our mover and our seconder. Table it. That's what to make those what 
So the recommendations that are made to turn them into friendly amendments will require us to table this because it's quite a few. And so I'm turning to our mover, if you're willing to table to have those additions of recommendations from speaker number nine, the technician that was made, or if you want to move forward on uh, this resolution right now as it is. R Rissell? Yeah. No, I'm, I'm not recommending recommendations. I'm, I'm recommending action items to the resolution, not recommendations from the speaker nine. You're, you're kind of mixing it up there. I'm confused about what you're saying, and I'm looking to the staff to clarify for me, and I think they're confused as well. So we're not clear. I'm going to turn back to you. Can you just... I'm not clear what you mean by actions out of, like, out of the resolution. Usually actions out of a resolution is based on the therefore be it resolves. Oh, okay. Well, just to add what Speaker 9 was saying, because she had very good uh, recommendations, um, I'm just suggesting that they be action items because, you know, that was a lot to add, but it, it's very good. So how can we follow up with that? I think it was board witnessed by the, your regional okay. chief, as well as your uh, water, BCF and water coordinator, as well as your board, who's also a mover okay. on this. Um, I could put it in point. Uh, I'm just looking at that going, and my understanding is I just want to be clear, because let's talk about the reality of this. This is the first time this is being presented. This will also be presented at the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. This will also be presented at the First Nation Summit, if that is my understanding. Uh, Yes, um, back over to number nine, please. Um, if it's easier, we can table it for a few minutes and I can work with the staff to make sure that those inclusions are in and then bring it back prior to adjourning today. I'm getting a nod. I'm just going to check in with our mover and seconder. I also know that we have a hard start with Minister Lametti in a minute. So I'm just looking to our mover. I'd like to continue with the motion that we have on the table, resolution that we have on the table right now. We have notes of the discussion and items that we should be considering and reviewing when we're putting together the plan on this particular item. The, the Drinking Water Quality Act, um, Crown Corporation use and There was one more um, there was three of them, I think. Not to hinder or obstruct oh, Dr. any current process that may be undertaken by current governments, such as the rights and title holders of the Tilkota Nation or any ongoing treaty negotiations. Just so that they don't intersect or infract. So I have, since we were still in discussion, uh, we didn't go to question. I've had other hands go up as well for further comments. So I'm going to go over to 24 and over to 19. If there's a friendly amendment to go in there, then we can add it in. Um, and so what, just to let you know, it's not a pressure. But just to let you know, at this time, Minister Lametti, in my understanding, is ready to present to you, does have a certain window of time, but I understand we're underway with this right now. So I'm going to continue onward with this right now. We'll go over to microphone. Is it number 24 that you have in your hand there? Yes, so 24, please. And please identify yourself. ACM, uh, South Telskui, uh, English names, Chief Ralph Leonis Dalis. Um, Thanking the, the mover and seconder for for the resolution that's on the table. Um, I find that we create our own tools here at this meeting to work together. And that's, you know, we, we can't lose focus of working together. Lots of mot. Um, Stayless, we don't condone uh, mining all those kinds of activities. Um, the last one was the gold rush up the head of the lake. Um, you know, we, we know what it does to our water. We need to protect it. We're a stronghold of salmon on the Harrison River, and we need to keep it that way. 
So the protection of water is um, real high in our thoughts, in our minds, and we want to keep it that way. We have a natural filtering system. We live on aquifer, just like our cook bee was saying, we live on rocks. <laughs> we don't flood, we flood from underneath. So I like the recommendations from Mike 13 to, to number nine. I think it's a good recommendation, but we also need to, to protect our resources as well from mining and all those other things. So mine's really small, simple. We don't condone mining. We need to protect it somehow. So with the with the mic nine, if if you can slide it in there somewhere, you know, water is supposed to be clean. It's supposed to be part of life, and that's why we like to keep it. ACM. Thank you for that. We'll go over to microphone number nineteen, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cheryl Kasmer, proxy. Um, I just wanted to make a recommendation or I guess maybe to remind ourselves that this resolution is basically to give the Leadership Council um, by way of the BCAFN the mandate to initiate these discussions based on the paper that was developed. So there's still room for changes to be made, additions, input feedback, that's the whole intent. So I don't know if we really need to go through m massive changes on the resolution at this point in time. It's just to help kickstart those discussions and give the mandate that's necessary. Uh, thank you for that. Um, well, there are the, I'm so grateful that the changes are now up on the screen. Um, Maureen, do you want us wa walk through where that what, one addition, addition was made, please? Um, we added, a, therefore be it resolved number five, uh, BCFN Chiefs and Assembly ensure that any discussions with BC do not inhibit or obstruct any First Nations undertaking overlapping initiatives or negotiations as part of their right to self-determination and sovereign rights. I see a nod from our mover and going over to a seconder. I see nods as well. Um, I'm, is there a need for further discussion on draft resolution number 10? Uh, so may we proceed to question? I'm seeing some nods, so question. Thank you for the nod for a question from Chief uh, Linda Price. Um, we're gonna go now, uh, any abstentions? Online? Okay, thank you. Um, I know there was one opposition. Is there any, and I note for the record, the one opposition of uh, Chief Don Harris, of Doug, uh, Douglas First Nation. Is there any further opposition to draft resolution number 10? Online? Seeing I declare it passed by majority. Thank you very much. And now we'll go right over to uh, Chief Justice Lametti, thank you for your patience, Chief Justice Lametti. We're so glad you're able to join us today. Welcome. If we could please have Chief uh, Justice Lametti uh, brought forward on. T and we'll just to go do a little tech check. Bonjour. Hello. Bonjour. Hello. Thank Welcome. you. Thank you. I'm glad you're able to join us. You, we can hear you well. How is it on your end? I know in the past we've had a little echo. You're all good. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, and the floor is yours. Welcome to the 19th Annual General Assembly of the BC Assembly of First Nations. We're glad you're here with us. Thank you, Madam thank Chair. You, Hello, Chair. Uh, bonjour. I want to start by acknowledging uh, that I'm here in my office in Ottawa, which sits on the traditional territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg Nation. Uh, thank you, uh, Regional Chief Terry TG, for the kind invitation to speak at your 19th Annual General Meeting. My thanks as well uh, to the elders, chiefs, uh, BCAFN executives, youth representatives, and all attendees for welcoming me to your gathering. It's always an honor to speak uh, with BCAFN members and to listen to you. I heard Chief Ralph Leon a moment ago, uh, whether in person or in a virtual setting. Uh, over this three-day meeting, and I've seen a bit of it now, you've been discussing issues of critical importance to First Nations across British Columbia. These conversations can help clarify the priorities for the upcoming year and lay their foundations for what you hope to achieve. I'm pleased to speak with you today about some of the many priorities we share 
the foundations we have set in place and what we have already started to build. So first of all, on UNDRIP, the Government of Canada is deeply committed uh, to the good that can be done through respectful partnership with uh, Indigenous peoples. This is clear in the work currently underway towards implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. In June, we replaced we released the first annual report outlining what had been accomplished so far. It marks the starting point of the historic work to implement the federal UN Declaration Act. The government is moving from legislative commitments to tangible action with First Nations, uh, Inuit and Métis partners. This includes the broad and inclusive uh, consultation, cooperation and co-development process we are undertaking with Indigenous peoples. This will help ensure that the action plan includes many voices and diverse perspectives. Early work has concentrated on providing funding to support the participation of Indigenous peoples and their, represent, their representative organizations, such as your own, in the process, including support for Indigenous-led consultations. And that funding is making its way to organizations. My department will continue to focus on First Nations, Inuit, and Métis right holders, including modern treaty signatories and self-governing nations, as well as national and regional Indigenous representative organizations. Department of Justice officials have already begun work with the BCAFN and other members of the First Nations Leadership Council. We're very much looking forward to continuing this partnership with you and your teams on this critical work, including preparing an action plan by June 2023, as in fact the legislation calls us to do. I do want to acknowledge the leadership of BC AFN Regional Chief TG, the AFN UN Declaration portfolio holder who brings a wealth of experience and knowledge that he has gained through the development of the British Columbia Provincial Action Plan. This will undoubtedly help inspire and accelerate the work on the federal action plan, both in BC and across the rest of Canada. I believe that this transformational work will help build stronger nation to nation, Inuit to Crown and government to government relationships between the federal government and First Nations, Inuit and Métis. This work will advance the implementation of the human rights of Indigenous peoples, including inherent rights to self-determination and to self-government. Another key element of the UN Declaration requires the Government of Canada to take all necessary measures to ensure that the laws of Canada, in this case federal laws, are consistent with the UN Declaration. This is a whole of government priority. We, in govern, uh, we as a government are committed to working in partnership with Indigenous peoples to identify the measures needed to make this happen. We also want to learn from British Columbia's experiences in its own work with, with Indigenous partners to ensure the alignment of its laws with the UN Declaration. This includes the new mechanisms and protocols you are putting in place with the BC government for the development of new laws and the review of older ones. I recognize that, the, that progress at the federal level may seem a bit slow in comparison, but there are some additional complexities and we must involve and reflect the distinctions and diversity of First Nations, Inuit and Métis across the country. However, we are always looking to learn from the good practices developed in BC and find in, innovative ways to do this much needed work. And these partnerships that we're building are an essential part of all that has been accomplished to date. There is another area of work I'd like to mention where we are, are seeing vital collaborative work, work that aims to find healing and justice for a painful part of our shared history. Earlier this month in Edmonton, the Office of the Independent Special Interlocutor held the inaugural national gathering on unmarked graves and burial sites associated with Indian residential schools. This was the first of many such gatherings that will take place across Canada over the next two years. These gatherings offer a forum for knowledge sharing on the barriers and best practices for searching, protecting and preserving unmarked burials on former Indian residential uh, grounds and associated sites. They will ultimately inform the legal reforms the special interlocutor will recommend to me, which in turn must align with the UN Declaration. I look forward to seeing this work take shape, and I'm so grateful to all of you who are contributing their, your thoughts and experiences as part of this process, including to Kamloops and Williams Lake, uh, and all others who've shown leadership and generosity in sharing their experience and knowledge 
with others undertaking searches. As we work toward efforts to heal the past and make improvements for the future, we can't ignore urgent needs we see right now. Part of this work requires criminal justice reform. Last December, our government introduced Bill C-5, which proposes to re reduce overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples by eliminating a number of minimum mandatory penalties and making conditional sentence orders more readily available. We are at the same time expanding the application of GLADU principles in the criminal justice system and negotiating administration of justice agreements with Indigenous communities across the country. Here, I would like to pause for a moment to acknowledge the terrible tragedy in James Smith Cree Nation uh, and uh, in Saskatchewan and the whole of Saskatchewan, I think. Like you, my thoughts are with all who are affected by this tragedy, victims and survivors, their families and friends and communities near and far. Such terrible events highlight the relevance of the work we're doing together to develop an Indigenous justice strategy. There are ongoing and planned engagements to identify needed reforms, to address systemic racism and the overrepresentation of Indigenous peoples in the criminal justice system, both as victims and as offenders. The BC First Nations justice strategy has been an inspiration uh, for the Indigenous justice strategy. That BC experience has helped us focus our objectives as we work together toward justice system reforms and as we revitalize Indigenous justice systems across the country. So again, I want to thank and acknowledge the work of Regional Chief Tiji, his leadership and his support in advancing these priorities. I want to turn uh, to a matter related to Indigenous self-governance and self-determination, uh, Indigenous gaming. I know that this is a long-standing and important priority for many First Nations. And I appreciate the candid conversations that I have had with Indigenous leaders and experts across Canada, including with the BC Leadership Council. I assure you that I remain committed to our ongoing discussions on the future of gaming uh, and, and doing this collaboratively with Indigenous uh, and provincial partners. As we gather today, we're one week from the second day for Truth and Reconciliation and Orange Shirt Day, a day inspired by Phyllis Webstad. It's a day for all people in Canada to recommit to reconciliation and a day to face the truth about Canada's history and its lasting impact so that we can move to make concrete progress together. September 30th is one important day in the calendar, but it is our collective work every day that will bring about the meaningful change that we need. So I look forward uh, to continue to working with you. I look forward to BCN's, uh, BCAFN's continued partnership in building a positive and healing future uh, for Indigenous peoples. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Lumetti. I appreciate that you left us some time for some questions from our chiefs in assembly. I much appreciate that. I do understand, unfortunately, you do have a hard stop at 12.30 our time. I, well, rec I already have one hand up for 25, then 24, uh, 13, 19. Uh, we'll get through what we can. So we're going to take a couple of questions. Uh, and then we'll go to you and take a couple more questions after that. So we'll go 25 first, please, and then we'll go straight over to 24. Thank you, honest, Honourable uh, Lamedi, uh, Minister Lamedi. I was wanting to ask for your support in helping to tear down some of the hurdles that we're having when it comes to funding our own path uh, to create our own policing agreements. At the moment, unless something fits into the existing age-old matrix models, there's no funding available, even though it's allotted towards the First Nations. If we don't find a space in the CTAs that are out there, there the, which there is funding for, we're, we, uh, we have no avenue to go after funding because of the strict uh, parameters that we're supposed to fit in. And I'm just wanting to make sure that, you know, as times are changing, that, th that they start to break down those parameters and uh, restrictions of us to go after the funding that's available to First Nations for uh, their own policing agreements with the province and with Canada. I met with Canada yesterday and they, they said that there is no movement on some of the restrictions that has to fit in a certain criteria. And I'm just wanting to uh, wanting assistance to, to maybe look at that uh, situation and break it down from the top to where we don't keep coming against that, uh, that hurdle. Cooks Jem. 
Thank you. Did you introduce yourself this time? Chief James Hobart, Spuzzum First Nation. Sorry, Chair. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll go straight over to microphone number 24. Again, I kindly encourage you to introduce yourself, introduce yourself both for the note taker as well as for the minister. Microphone 24, please. Thank you, uh, Chief Ralph Leon, uh, David Lametti's nephew. Um, <laughs> he's my uncle. You're, you're way better looking than me, Chief Ralph. I, yeah. I, I have to, uh, it's been an improvement over the generation. Yeah, but anyways, uh, we provided your office with uh, some paperwork. We met with National Chief uh, Roseanne Archibald and uh, Regional Chief uh, Terry Tiji, and we provided them with some paperwork. Uh, we are doing some phenomenal work in Staelis, and we'd like to come to your office and uh, have a meeting with you, present our, our work to you, and also um, ask for your support in our work. The work's already almost done, so we're not asking you to do work. So we want to help you look good. So we're asking you to, you know, open up your office. Um, we'll lock out that guy beside you, Mr. Viss, and uh, come and meet with you and uh, at the, you know, as soon as we can, because our work is ready, ACM. So if I understand correctly, Chief Lon, you want to take him from uncle status to deadly uncle status. Yeah, yeah. Help him look excellent. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, thank um, you. Minister Lametti, we're going to uh, invite you to answer these two. Then we've got two more after that, and I understand that will most likely take us to time. Okay, perfect. Well, first of all, Chief Ralph, thank you. Uh, you're always welcome in my office. Um, I do, uh, and and look, I, I know you were making a joke, but I do my best to work with, with MP Viss as well, and uh, and I've had a good relationship from the days he was Ed Fast's assistant uh, in 2015, and he was my office neighbor. So um, please, I would love to, I know the work is ongoing, uh, and I know the issue you're talking about, and I uh, would love to host you here, uh, particularly if it means I don't have to do any additional work, but uh, but even if I do have to do some additional work, I'm, I'm always pleased. So, so by all means, uh, let's let's work and organize a meeting uh, in person now that we can do that again. Um, uh, Chief Hobart, thank you uh, for your intervention. I know that Minister Mendicino spoke to you yesterday. Um, I, I'm going to keep pushing. I know, I, I know from my consultations with you and with other leaders across Canada how, how important, important and, complex and complex the question of, of policing is. It, it, it changes from nation to nation and place to place. So I will do my best uh, to, to push uh, for flexibility in that regard. Um, and I really do, I, I really do understand uh, the need to be flexible, and I really do understand how important it is um, for all people, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, to live in, in safety and security and to feel safe and secure, and to feel that the, the, the police authorities uh, not only are, are there as police authorities, but also represent the community and understand the community and understand the values and, and laws of the community. So I, I will do my best to help. It's, it's in Min Minister Mendicino's profile directly, uh, portfolio directly, but I, but I will uh, do my best to be an ally. Thank you very much for those responses. We'll now go over to microphone 13, immediately followed by microphone 19, and then back to you, Minister Lametti. Microphone 13, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Lise Pahan, Chief of Coldwater Band. Uh, good to see you, Minister Lamedi. Um, just a, a quick question and comment to you in regards to jurisdiction and en enforcement. Back when uh, COVID first came in place, the Coldwater Indian Band put a bylaw in place, and you know we we seeked recommendations from Merritt RCMP. And it took a long time because they had to go back to their union, they had to go back to their lawyers and to get back to us. So with you and your ministry, how are you gonna provide support for not only Quarter Indian Band, but other First Nations in British Columbia on the enforcement of our bylaws within the jurisdiction of our bands? Thank you for that. I will go over to microphone 19, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Cheryl Kazmer, Proxy. 
Um, thank you, Minister, for being with us here today. Um, my questions are specific to the um, Bill 15 and the implementation of that. So um, we understand that the first annual report was released uh, on June 21st, 2022. And in that report, we understand that there um, are, ch it mentions that there's changes that are being anticipated to the Federal Interpretation Act to include a non-derogation clause. Uh, I'm just wondering what the status of that work is because as title and right holders or Indigenous governing bodies and representative organizations, we've not had any of that information or that work shared with us to date. And I think it's gonna be critical for um, title and rights holders to be involved right from the outset if we wanna see the implementation of this act to be successful. Second to the annual report, it also mentioned that the federal government's developing internal policies to advise ministries um, and that there's an interim guide that's been developed. And our concern is that it was developed without involvement of First Nations title and rights holders, IGBs and representatives. And again, wondering if you could share with us the status of that work and when First Nations are going to become involved I'm also concerned, and I, but I also understand the complexity that the federal government has in terms of um, meet, meeting the target of 2023 mm -hmm. for the development of the action plan. Um, but we're 2022 right now, that doesn't really leave a lot of time. And here in British Columbia, we've been advocating for a regional-based approach for the development of that action plan. And we're not hearing anything from the federal government in terms of what that process is going to look like to include the input and feedback from respective nations across this country. So just getting a bit concerned in terms of timing, and we've indicated numerous occasions, Minister Lametti, that British Columbia First Nations are here to support the work at the federal level, given the work and expertise that we have here with DRIPA. And so if there's anything that we can do to help advance this work, we're here to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to go back to you, Minister Lametti, for responses to those last questions, as well as any final remarks you have for the Chiefs and Assembly here today. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, first of all, Chief Lee, thank you. Uh, the, the, the enforcement of bylaws, uh, especially well during COVID, it showed us how well uh, First Nations uh, could uh, pivot on a on a major health uh, pandemic across that was international and and first nations did did frankly a great job uh, in protecting their 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 nations and their communities and so I, I know there's a larger issue we're working at it it's tricky it involves not just first nations and the federal government but also the provinces uh, it involves moving beyond the Indian Act uh, as well uh, in 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 places where that uh, where that still applies and so Part of the development of the Indigenous Justice Strategy is is going to is going to focus, I would imagine, on that. I think that's the feedback we're going to get. But in addition, we've got a number of tables going in in a number of different places across Canada, and so we'll be open to looking at that uh, looking at that with you. Um, again, as as I'd said uh, previously, it's critically important that people feel safe. But it's also critically important that Indigenous nations, uh, in, in your case, a, a First Nation, be able to, you know, promulgate its its own laws, and and have those laws defended uh, and and upheld uh, by whatever institution uh, is is charged with doing that, whether that be a, a, a an Indigenous uh, authority or whether that be a, a, an agreed upon non-Indigenous authority. So. Happy to work with you on that, and 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 my team will reach out to you uh, to see where you're at and and how we might be able to push that uh, file forward. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Proxy, for for uh, for uh, Cookby Kashmir. Um, three really important questions, and uh, let me let me start first of all with uh, with the non-derogation clause. There's there has there has been a lot of work done on that for a long time. Uh, a lot of it, and there's still been a lot of back and forth. We we had a call for consultations um, across uh, across uh, Indigenous peoples across Canada uh, for the better period of about a year, and we got a lot of feedback on it. Um, I can say that uh, that there has been a, a I think a fair bit of consensus on on how to move forward uh, with that. I've had that 
discussion now with with a number of, of groups we can go back and we can reach back out to you uh, and to see uh, where uh, where you might have st stood in contributing to that process and and certainly pick that uh, pick that discussion up with you um, and obviously it's crit obviously it's critically important uh, as as a part of this moving forward it is part of UNDRIP, but it's not part of UNDRIP in the sense that we are prepared to move uh, more quickly on the non-derogation clause uh, if, if, if that is, in, in fact, uh, where we land uh, with, in partnership with you uh, because of its importance. Um, with respect to, uh, with, with respect, uh, to the, uh, any instructions that we have given to uh, other parts of the federal government in terms of, in terms of the development of, of implementing UNDRIP, um, I can get uh, any specific uh, any specific instructions back to you, but I can tell you that the, the gist of it will be that we're telling all of our partner uh, ministers and ministries that they have to reach out to Indigenous peoples across Canada and thinking through their own legislation as part of the regular under it process. So, um, my my sense is is that the 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 the, inst the instructions, if you will, or the manual, if you will, is precisely to consult and cooperate with Indigenous peoples in developing policy, because that's that's what UNDRIP uh, requires us to do, and it's it has the benefit of being the right thing to do as well. Um, I know the timing is tight uh, on your third point. Um, I, I had pushed for three years uh, when we were trying to pass C-15, but um, it was a, a number of, of Indigenous leaders who pushed it back down uh, to two and some wanted one. I know it's tight. We have a feasible time frame. We have uh, we have been working, uh, as I as I noted in my speech, um, getting resources out to Indigenous leadership groups, including the BCAFN, uh, to lead uh, to lead uh, the Indigenous uh, led to lead the Indigenous parts of the consultation. And so uh, I would ask you. To first of all, get in touch with with me if you have specific thoughts or comments, but also get in touch with the BCAFN. Uh, and I mentioned Regional Chief TG, who is who is leading that portfolio for the AFN nationally. Um, and there will be other other uh, leadership groups in uh, British Columbia, which will also be taking in and 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 thinking through. Uh, suggestions uh, for how to move forward in terms of the action plan. So there, there are a number of different ways in which uh, in, in which your people can can participate in the process directly with with uh, the Justice Department secretary, but also uh, also uh, working through uh, your your own indigenous leadership structures. I'm pretty confident we can still do this. There's a lot of work to do. Um, and uh, I'm prepared to do whatever I need to do in order to support uh, the uh, in indigenous leadership groups that are that are right now on the ground, uh, working with uh, nations and 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 other groups, other representative groups, uh, elected and non-elected uh, traditional groups to to make sure that that everyone's voice is heard. So. We'll do our best. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out uh, to my office or have, have uh, Cookby Kashmir reach out to my office and we will do our best uh, to answer any specific points of and identify specific points of contact uh, for, uh, for your, your nation. Just want to say thank you again. Uh, we've got a lot of work to do with UNDRIP uh, as, as has been pointed out over the next uh, little while. Uh, let's roll up our sleeves uh, and get it done. I know how important this is to you and maybe the deadline will focus us uh, all together uh, to push hard to, to really do something that I think is going to not just vastly improve the day-to-day -day life of Indigenous peoples, but also do a rethink in terms of how Canada functions. And, it, and I, I think it will do nothing less than make this, this place more just uh, and we'll we'll begin to fulfill the 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 dream of peoples working together in a in a, a collaborative and harmonious way. So I and I'm I'm not dreaming in technicolor. I really do believe this is this is not just possible, but the only way forward. And I I'm going to keep going in that direction uh, until I can't anymore. So thank you.
Thank you so very much, uh, Minister Lametti, for joining us today. And um, a pre pardon the brief delay, but we made the most of the time we had with you. We wish you well for the remainder of your day. Um, and so just before we uh, recess for lunch, I just wanted to go over some housekeeping items. Um, one, you may have noticed there's some items in the beginning of t or this morning that we didn't get to. So we have the drinking water class action suit. Want to remind you that they still have a booth here. So please feel free any direct questions you might have with them at the lunchtime when you want to go stretch your legs and take one last round through our exhibitors. I encourage you to ask those direct questions to them. This is a, a, an update. We're going to have energy and mining go ahead. Um, it will be with Cole so uh, Sayers as Paul needs to leave um, just at about one, but he is is here, was here, um, but Cole is also here. Cole, you just want to stand up and give a wave. Um, we'll also have the dialogue sessions and the murder missing Indigenous women and girls, uh, two SLGBTQIA plus relatives um, update from uh, BCAFN Women's Representative Louisa Housty Jones, and there is a resolution with that. And then we'll uh, wrap up with uh, the remainder of our on-time resolutions and hopefully get to those late resolutions that were brought forward. A um, couple of reminders for lunch break as well is there are travel forms over. Joanna, is it over with you? Over there, where? Just, you're just pointing, I can't see. So she's pointing over by the banner right where the uh, survey is. There's travel forms for chiefs and proxies. We're going to do a draw for door prizes um, right at the end of lunch. So we're going to break till 1.15. So we are going to respect our timetable in the sense that we are going to come back at um, 1.15. At least that's I think it had there. Well, I'm actually just cutting you a little short. I'm sorry. I just I know we have a long day. We want to be able to get through our business at hand. So we're gonna um, we're gonna recess until 1:15. We're gonna uh, reconvene at 1:15. So bon appetit. Enjoy uh, enjoy the great food that has been placed out for you. And we'll see you back here at 1:15. Thank you.
class action suit update. So, Cole, do you want to? Great, excellent. And is it a PowerPoint or just you're just podium? Okay, so uh, not sure where you're going. Okay. <laughs> So you do have a PowerPoint or sticky notes or, or okay. the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you for having me, um, Chief Terry, Terry GTG and all the chiefs here. Uh, I'll keep this brief because I know we're behind and we uh, we don't have too much to update you on. Um, so we did provide an update at the First Nations Leadership Council uh, earlier this summer. And uh, basically, we updated you on the engagement that happened earlier this year, which went out, was a more of a wide ranging uh, activity to figure out what our priorities are. Now we're kind of in the, in, the, in the period where we're going to focus more specifically on what those priorities are and really kind of flesh them out. Uh, so part of that is um, we're proposing uh, three engagement tables. With this. So I, I'm gonna go through that. That's all available to you. We've updated you on that before. It's available online. Um, but on the next slides, we have um, our first table, which is electricity. We have the electricity table, the legislative table, and the hydrogen market opportunities table. Each of these tables are gonna have basically a two-year timeline. So for the electricity table, for example, the first year is just gonna be a knowledge and capacity building year. Where our, our, our objective there is to ensure that we all are all on the same page. One of the difficulties that we have within the clean energy industry is that there are some folks who are, uh, you know, have a lot of experience around electricity, transmission, distribution, and all the technical aspects of this stuff, and there are other folks who are, who are new and who are learning. And, and so it, we're trying to ensure that we can have these discussions without uh, um, having, having each discussion where we're at and be able to advance the conversation as a whole so that we are, our priorities are, are um, prioritized and achieved. So the next slide is on the hydrogen market opportunities table. Uh, our next activity for this is, is going to be doing a hydrogen opportunity study as well as renewable natural gas. Um, and that, that'll get rolled out early, uh, sometime this fall. And um, so what we're, what we're hoping here is to provide First Nations with a credible source uh, uh, of information on hydrogen what the short, medium, and long-term opportunities are, and hopefully what the impacts are on the various ways that we can not only produce hydrogen, but uh, how it can be transported, whether it's by marine or on ground. Um, next slide, please. And lastly, the last table is the legislative standing table. This is just going to look at uh, the relevant legislation and policy regulations. Um, and overall, we're going to have uh, an advisory group with First Nations on it um, to really kind of guide this whole process. And, um, and so that guide the process, and we're also going to be proposing uh, an engagement later this fall, but we'll provide the information when we have it. And lastly, last slide, next steps. Um, like I said, we're going to have uh, an in-person engagement, kind of style workshop, to hear from First Nations on these specific priorities, um, as well as being able to provide more information on any sort of specific priority that that First Nations are interested in, such as utilities, uh, retail access, hydrogen, renewable natural gas, really anything that you're interested in, we would love to hear about it. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I'm, I'm around. You can contact Paul Blom or me if you have any follow-up questions. Uh, I, know we're, I know we're behind on time, so I think I don't think there's questions, but uh, reach, please reach out if you have any. Let's take you over to um, microphone number one of those, because there's a question right off the floor right now. Thank you so very much, uh, Cole. And um, I saw one hand go immediately up, so we'll go over to microphone number 13, please. Hi, thank you, Elise Mahan, Chief Quarter Bend. Um, just a really quick question. Um, it's kind of unclear um, how. Uh, are you serving the interests of the uh, title and rights holders and are working in the interests of the nations or are you working in, in your own interests as an organization? Because 
you know, there's, there's a lot of mining activity going on out there. And we see these referrals, I see them constantly. And it, it's unclear as to where energy and mining is coming from because it seems like they're, they're doing their own thing and not listening to the First Nations. And um, we got a problem with that because with uh, one of the mines that's doing a project within their site and not properly consulting with us is totally unacceptable. So, and that's why I raised that question. Gokstam. Microphone number two, please. No, thank you for that question. It's very, it's a very important one. And my, my personal opinion is, you know, free prior informed consent should be, should be first and foremost. That's how it um, should shape these, these processes. Uh, I unfortunately can't answer that because I'm not involved with it, with mining. Uh, my, my background is in energy, clean energy, and in that regard, I, I don't speak for the nations. I just speak on specific issues that are raised by the independent power producers, which are uh, often owned by First Nations. So in that regard, I, I work with First Nations and, and just kind of pass along their priorities and interests. Um, but of course, I can't answer your question regarding mining. Uh, yeah, you had a follow-up. I see that I can read lips today. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you. And that's exactly what we did when we opposed the project that uh, is occurring within the mining site. And, and the company said that they um, didn't really need to consult with us. And that was totally unacceptable. And we informed them that, you know, you need free prior and informed consent before anything moves forward. And we put them on notice. And we've also sent uh, letters to the province because it seems like the province is pointing fingers at uh, the organization and putting the nations towards each other. And, and that's totally unacceptable. So thank you. Gukstam. Thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Cole. I'm just going to look around the room if there's not seeing anything online. Again, thank you so much for accommodating us. And I know Paul was here earlier. Paul Blum was here earlier. Unfortunately, he had to leave. Uh, we did help. We have, uh, and I'm just looking at which title you're using right now. You have many wonderful titles. We love all of them. So we're going to proxy Judah Sayers uh, <laughs> online, please. Thank you, Raisel. I just wanted to really support the work uh, that's being done in clean energy. You know, right now with all of the climate change, the atmospheric rivers, the flooding, the winds, you know, the need for our communities to be independent in electricity has, is becoming more critical. Um, you know, it can be days before power is restored. There are, it, I, I, previous assemblies you supported a new relationship throughout the BC Indigenous Clean Energy Initiative to get a half half a billion dollars basically to try and get funding for First Nations to develop their own projects. Um, right now, we do have small funding um, pots. There's um, some remote community initiatives. I believe is about twenty nine million that will be. Um, considering projects for remote communities, there's also an additional 3.3 million for BCICEI and those calls for proposals. I really encourage all of you to be developing. I know this isn't enough money for a project itself, but to get, you know, some money towards your projects, just a, a real advocate of clean energy and appreciate the work that Paul and Cole and uh, Dave do in, in clean energy and encourage you to get involved in their um, sessions coming up. So really just wanted to support that and, and just let you know some of the money that's coming up and available um, to First Nations so you can start putting those together. So thank you. Thank you for those uh, comments. Uh, thank you again, Cole. And um, I appreciate again uh, you and your colleagues accommodating us today. We're going to move directly on to our next uh, session. Thanks again to our drinking water class action suite representatives, Kevin Hill and John Brown. Thank you for your patience. We're going to invite you over to any of the three microphones to my right there, whatever suits your fancy um, for your presentation. Hopefully you've had a chance to interact with them uh, during this entire AGM as they did have their booth set up. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Uh, hey, Suelle, hello. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Musqueam First Nation for allowing us to come and speak to you today. And I'd like to acknowledge and give thanks to uh, Dr. Gwendolyn Point for her beautiful opening prayer and song so we could start in a good way. Uh, my name is John Brown. My family on my father's side is Stalo from the Fraser River Valley. I'm a lawyer at McCarthy Tatro. I've been there for about 41 years now. Most of that time, I've specialized in class actions. My colleague Kevin Hill and I are here to talk to you about the clean water class action settlement and the benefits that your First Nation can receive if it, just, if it chooses to participate in the class action. So, Kevin. <coughs> Yeah, good afternoon, and again, thank you very much for having us here. Um, as John said, my name's Kevin Hill. I'm a lawyer uh, with OKT Law and one of the class counsel on the, on the drinking water class action. And in particular, I wanna, I wanna thank, obviously, Musqueam First Nation for hosting us. And as I came uh, into the community, I passed the golf club um, which, as all of you likely know, um, was the subject of serious litigation about 50 years ago. Um, Musqueam sued Canada for the maladministration of the reserve and the decision to lease that land. Canada's defense to that was, oh, this is political. There's no legally enforceable duty on Canada to uh, deal with the reserve land in any particular way. Now, again, as all of you no doubt know, the Supreme Court rejected that and said Canada owed a duty when it was dealing with reserve lands. Now, I mention that because 50 years later, when Nishkantiga First Nation came to us, having been under a drinking water advisory for half that time, for 25 years, being unable to drink the water coming out of their taps. When Nishkantiga came to us to say, what can we do about this? That was still Canada's position. The promises to lift drinking water advisories were political, and there was no enforceable duty to provide clean drinking water on reserve. I'm happy to say uh, now that has all changed. Um, Nishkantiga, it turned out, was one of 250 nations across the country that had been under long-term drinking water advisories. Many of your nations have been as well. Um, there are 95 First Nations in BC that were under a long-term drinking water advisory since 1995. Um, so far, 38 of them have accepted the settlement. So what we're really out to do here is explain what it has to offer you and to get out to those remaining nations to ensure they know, ensure you know, what is available for your communities. First and foremost, like the Musqueam case, this settlement turns a political promise into a legally enforceable obligation on Canada, and one that's accompanied by at least $6 billion in water and wastewater infrastructure spending. That is available to your communities if you have issues with your drinking water, if your members are not getting clean water from their taps. There's also compensation. Compensation not just for individuals, but for First Nations as a whole. By accepting the settlement, your nation will be eligible for um, a base payment of half a million dollars, plus an amount equal to half of what all your individual members are compensated. So again, time is tight, and we won't go over all the details. Um, but we, we welcome you and invite you to come speak to us at the booth or to get in touch with us um, by email or give me a call. Um, my, my number and my email are online and, and easily available. 
I'll turn it over to John now for a few more so, comments. Uh, hopefully you've all got these two documents on the, on the table in front of you. One is the list of the eligible First Nations in BC. If your name is on this list, you can choose to participate in the settlement. It costs you nothing. All we need from you is a band council acceptance resolution, and we can send you a draft template for that. So if you're on, we, like, as Kevin said, 38 uh, First Nations have already sent in their band council acceptance resolution, and we're looking to uh, help the rest of you understand what's available. The second sheet gives you some details about what's involved. And on the second page, or the third page at the end, there's a website, firstnationdrinkingwater.ca, and it has all the details about the settlement. And just to pick up on a couple of points that Kevin made, the most important thing is you do have to send in a BCAR. The deadline is December 2nd. We can help you with whatever you need to do. The compensation that Kevin talked about, the half a million dollar base payment, 50% of whatever your individual class members receive as well. That's retrospective. Looking forward, the $6 billion fund, and that's a minimum of $6 billion, is available to your First Nations to cover the actual cost, not 80%, not 70%, but the actual cost of constructing, repairing, replacing, operating, and maintaining water infrastructure so that your members can receive water in the same quantity and same quality as your non-Indigenous neighbours. And the last point, which is equally important, is that if you have a dispute within that process, if you submit your design and you want to get this done, and ISC says, let's go to the usual routine, routine. would it take 10 or 20 years to work through this process with you? The settlement agreement has a, a, a dispute resolution process built into it which requires any disputes to be decided in your communities using your protocols, traditions, and procedures. And it's final, and it's speedy, and it's fair. And that, that takes it out of ISC's hands, it takes it out of the court system, and it gives you a speedy resolution to your water issues. So bottom line is we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to answer any questions. We know we can't do it now, but we'll be outside afterwards. Classify for your for your attention. Thank you very much. I did wanted to. Uh, there was a comment shared online by Cook B. Judy Wilson. She said, "Thank you, Nisconleth joined the water settlement, and it has been very helpful to their water issues." So I just wanted to rec um, acknowledge that as well. And I appreciate that you were in attendance this whole annual general assembly for people to be able to interact with you directly. Thank you for providing materials and also understanding our timelines for today. So Cooks Chatham, we wish you all Thank and you. safe travels. At this time, I'm gonna call forward, um, where are we? There we are. So I'm delighted to call forward the BCAFN's woman's representative, Louisa Housty Jones, uh, to provide an update on the dialogue sessions on MMIWG 2S Plus or MMIWG 2S LGBTQIA Plus. So please uh, come forward and I welcome you to the podium, uh, Louisa Housty Jones. Gonna put. Just gotta put my. Power up here. Okay. 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 Oh, here's the clicker. And he's gonna. Oh, you're gonna do yeah. this one. Okay. Excellent. Yay. So much better. Ah, save the best for last. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> so good afternoon, everybody. Um, I would like to acknowledge and thank the Musqueam Nation for hosting us this week and for their hospitality. As well, thank you to Dr. Gwendolyn Point for opening us in a good way. I also want to acknowledge all the excellent work that has happened over the past few days. My traditional name is Umkalux. My English name is Louisa Housty Jones. 
I am a member and a counselor of the Helsic Nation. It's been an honor to serve as a BCAFN women's representative and sit on the AFN Women's Council for the past four years. I am grateful for the opportunity to address the assembly in person and share about the work BCAFN is doing to support women's representation and violence. Today I'll, I will provide an update on the development regarding the calls for justice the 2022 dialogue sessions and resolution of supporting been brought forward. Women and 2SLGBTQQIA plus strategic action plan development and First Nations gender-based analysis plus. I'll start with a bit of background regarding the calls for justice. In 2021, the National Action Plan on MMIWG2S Plus was released. It identified several immediate next steps, however, failed to set forth an implementation plan with measurable actions and timelines. <clears throat> Continued involvement of survivors and family members in the implementation of the National Action Plan. Create an oversight body, public awareness and training, immediate development of an implementation plan, missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, federal, provincial, territorial table, create accountability mechanisms for reporting. In 2022, the National Action Plan Progress Report was released. It provided many important work been carried out in the at the community level. However, it found that progress of the identified priorities was limited. The federal government failed in its responsibility to coordinate and lead the establishment of the foundational oversight accountability implementation measures in partnership with Indigenous people. The progress report made several recommendations aimed at reestablishing a proper foundation for this work, including repeat, repeating the immediate priorities set out in the original 2021 action plan. At the provincial level, one of the province's key commitments was the path forward to establish the, was the establishment of the $4.5 million community fund to support the need for safe spaces and safe plans and Indigenous community-led solutions. The BC Association of Aboriginal Friendship Centres was selected to manage the funds and is engaging with communities on a collaborative next steps, including the establishment of the advisory committee. While the fund is a positive development that will hopefully support families and grassroots led efforts, I believe that increased multi-year funding commitments and initiatives that target systemic shifts are required. In all of this, BCAFN's advocacy continues to guide by the finding of the 2021 engagement on the implementations of the calls for justice. There are a couple of developments that may be of interest and I'd like to share. In August, CERNAC announced a pre-engagement process regarding oversight of the National Action Plan and released a discussion paper. There is a contact if you are interested in engaging and BCFN will continue to engage in this process and share out information as we receive. We also know that CERNAC and DOJ have also started preliminary work regarding the potential of the National Indigenous Human Rights Mechanism, such as the tribunal. We expect more on this to come shortly. Next, I will, I will provide an overview of the 2022 Women's and 2SLGBTQQIA dialogue sessions. 
The annual gathering provides a space for women and 2SLGBTQQIA plus to discuss issues of importance, connect and identify priorities. BCAFN values this space as a way to shape our advocacy and ensure we are working for the more for our future and community members. On day one, our theme was stories that connect us, storytelling, interconnection, and reclaiming. The session held space for First Nations women, 2S LGBT, QQIA plus people in BC to come together, share our experiences, and gain strength, inspiration, and insight. Our sessions included reclaiming space in a male-dominated sector, reclaiming safety and inclusion in political and advocacy, a deep dive into themes, inspiration and identity, reclaiming our language and cultures, experience the deaf and hard, hard of hearing community, the power of storytelling, On day two, our theme was everyone has a sacred role. Allyship, our, our panelists shared examples on how communities are working to enhance the leadership, safety, and well being of First Nations women, gender diverse, and 2S LGBT QQIA plus people. They also explored the role of Indigenous men and boys have in supporting the rights, safety, and well being of Indigenous women and 2S LGBT QQIA plus people. We also held space for First Nations men to hear the priorities of First Nations women, gender diverse, and 2S LGBT QQIA plus people and dialogue together about how members of our communities can be a part of the positive change. On day three, our theme was listen and take action. At the session, we presented, draft, we presented the draft 2022 dialogue session report to the dialogue session participants, First Nation governments, and non-First Nation organizations. In doing so, we fostered an understanding of an action on First Nations women and 2S LGBT QQIA plus experiences and priorities. Through the session and the roundtable discussions, we gathered many insights, recommendations, which are included in the draft report. We don't have time to go into everything here, but I do encourage you to explore what we gathered from this discussion and consider joining us personally and supporting members of your community to attend in the future. We truly all have a role in this work. I will now shift into an update on the development of the Women and 2S LGBT QQIA Strategic Action Plan. In terms of our progress, we are in between phase two and three. We have done some engagements and initial drafting and are looking forward to next steps. I'll walk through our progress in the next few slides. At the 2022 dialogue session, BCAFN invited feedback on the principles, vision, and progress, a process of the strategic action plan to implement the women and the 2S LGBT QQIA plus people's declaration. We are thankful for everyone who provided their insight and perspective. A snapshot of this feedback is included in the dialogue session report and will be integrated as a foundation to the strategic action plan. I would also like to invite additional feedback from chiefs and leaders and those in your community who would, like to, who would like to be informed on this process. You can reach out to me or BCFN staff at any time. Based on the feedback we've heard so far, far I'd like to share some of the elements that are currently been developed. 
We hope to see Imaginary along the way with text to help communicate and simplify this plan as per some of the feedback we received. This image shows the draft principles that, plants, that plan is informed by. They are portrayed as stones that will carry with us. Presentation, representation and leadership, collaboration and partnership, holistic, culture, healing and hope, action and accountability, sovereignty, best practices and tools. Each one includes pieces of the women and 2S LGBT QQIA plus declaration that give expression to that principle, as you can see on the screen with this example. In this next image, we explore what these principles look like in action using best practices and tools. Our next steps are to determine specific actions, act actors, timeframes, and milestones. The first draft, which we have already started using a template like you've seen on the screen. We are also exploring the best focus for an environment scan and on a, or a survey identified in phase two. Finally, I'd like to share that we are still working to develop a toolkit, a pilot to support First Nations approaches and, cap and capacity for intersectional advocacy, as was mandated by the resolution this spring. I hope to have more information to share on this soon, and I'd be happy to speak to anyone who is interested. So with that, Thank you for listening. Together we can continue our efforts to honor First Nations women, girls, and 2S LGBTQIA plus people, support healthy families and communities, and break the cycle of violence and colonialism. It will take us all. So I'm grateful for your support and ask even for more support, not only for my role, but for support for women leaders, our women and 2S LGBT QQIA plus council and those working on the front lines. Gayasika. All right. So there is a resolution, resolution number 11. And just as I'm getting set up here, just a little fun housekeeping thing. Again, thank you to the drinking water settlement folks. They had a draw at their booth for salmon. And the winner is, I know I'm gonna say this wrong, but I'm gonna attempt it anyways, Lelania Polly. So if you have a last name Polly and your name starts with a Le, Lelania, that would be you, and you won um, a bunch of salmon. So congratulations. So, and thank you again, Louisa, for that presentation. Thank you for accommodating us with the shifts in our agenda. And so we're going to draft resolution number 11. Support for the woman, gender diverse, and 2S LGBTQQA plus dialogue session report. This was moved by uh, Cookby Roseanne Kazmir, Tukamlu Tishwetmach, and also Tukamlu um, Tishwetmach. And we're looking for a seconder. And it is a short, therefore be it resolved. So therefore be it resolved. The BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly fully support the dialogue sessions and the recommendations and key takeaways gathered in the report on the BC Assembly of First Nations 2022 Women, Gender Diverse, and the Two-Spirit, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans, 
uh, queer questioning, intersex, and asexual plus people's dialogue session, stories connect us and call on the regional chief, BCAFN's women's representative, and staff to support their implementation and expression. So again, thank you for being here. Cook Bureau Roseanne Kashmir as the mover. We are looking, I got a number 19. Seconder, please, for the records. Can you? 19? Cheryl Kazmer, proxy for Akam. Thank you very much. So I'm going to turn over to our mover. Do you have anything? Would you like to address this resolution? Yes, I I'm, can't see the number. I believe it's 28. Okay, thank you. 28. Check. Hello. Um, yes, Waikwa Waiitip Cook Bureau Zan Kazmer runs Quest to come Mr. I'm very honored to be here and acknowledging the lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Tooth, and um, you know all the amazing work that has been taken over um, the last few days here. And with this resolution, I hold very near and dear to my heart, and you know really want to hold my hands up to. Um, Louisa and the BCAFN team for all the work that they've put into this, you know, as was shared in the report that was presented by Louisa. So I just wanted to add that and, you know, most importantly, it's about um, being inclusive and being respectful and, most importantly, honoring each other. So Cook Shem. Thank you very much. I'm going to go over to our seconder, uh, Cheryl Kazmer, proxy. Uh, Microphone 19, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't really have much more to add other than I'm glad to see that this is um, being tabled and hopefully uh, su fully supported by delegates around the table. This is really important work and we know how important it is to make sure that we can do whatever we can to create those safe spaces and safe places for, for um, all women. And, um, the, uh, and be gender diverse. Thank you. Thank you very much from our mover and seconder. The floor is now open for discussion on draft resolution number 11, support for the woman, gender diverse, and 2S LGBTQIA plus dialogue session report. Is there need for further discussion on draft resolution number 11? Question has been called. Oh, online. online. One hand, so sorry, Judy, Cook be Judy. I wasn't trying to. Uh, we'll go over to Cook B. Judy Wilson. Um, and so we'll, we'll hold okay. that question. Uh, the floor is I, yours, Cook B. Judy Wilson. I just wanted to uh, thank Louisa for her report and the work she's doing on, uh, on all fronts, really, and the report that's coming out and the call for more input and uh, to take time. I, I certainly will do that as well. Our Vancouver Coalition uh, uh, meets uh, every month, and um, uh, if she hasn't reported there, that might be a, a good place. We have 30 plus different organizations and survivors and people that attend uh, monthly. Uh, that might be a good place for more input. If she, if she hasn't done that, if she's done that, I'll just follow up with her individually. So again, thank you. And it's a, a lot of work because we had the Tatiana Harris and the Noella Osoup and uh, Quim, uh, Manuel Gofferson and many other uh, women, Chelsea Poorman, uh, you know, that that uh, this work is so important, but also, you know, for the men too, uh, that they need our support as well for all of the work that's being done. So I just wanted to say thank you. And I support this resolution. Thank you very much. And now, now I'm gonna check, we're gonna go with question. I didn't see any other. So thank you very much. We've gone to question. Is there any abstentions? to draft resolution number 11. Seeing none, is there any opposition to draft resolution number 11? Again, seeing none, um, I declare it passed by consensus. Thank you very much. We're gonna go on now to uh, draft, on time draft resolution number 12, provincial statutory holiday for National Day of Truth and Reconciliation. There is no mover or seconder at this time, so we are looking for a mover and seconder on this. And just to get uh, right, Chief Don Tom has put up his hand to be a mover. And I have uh, Chief Lee Spahan as seconder. That was super fast and easy, thank you. Um, I think we're all very familiar with 
uh, the, the holiday, and there's, but there is information in the whereas, so we'll go straight into the therefore be it resolved. Therefore be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly fully support making September 30th a provincial statutory holiday through changes in legislation and regulation made in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous people and to the BC Chiefs and Assembly calls upon the province of BC to make meaningful investments in public education, commemoration, and remembrance events, sites, memorials, and other initiatives that are planned by Indigenous people. I'll go to our mover, Chief Don Tom, if you have further things to say about this resolution. No, you do not. I'll go over to Chief Lee Spahan if you have further things a seconder to say about this resolution. Yes, no, I don't know what that means. No, okay, thank you so much. So that would be, we're good. I'm going to open the floor if there is need for further discussion on draft resolution 12, provincial statutory holiday for National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. But that was like a good lahal move, sort of. <laughs> um, it's not seeing any online. Need for further discussion? Questions has been called. Thank you. Is there any abstentions to draft resolution 12? Any opposition to draft resolution 12? We're good. So I'll declare that passed by consensus. Thank you very much. And I, oh yeah, you have seen this before because it was over at UBCIC prior. Sorry about that. So then we have um, draft resolution number, on time draft resolution number 13, alignment of forestry successorship with UN declaration. We are looking for a mover on this as well as a seconder. So we are looking for a mover and seconder on draft resolution number 13. Just to get you, a, okay, we'll have Chief Don Tom as the mover on this. We are looking for a seconder on draft resolution number 13, 2022, alignment with forestry, alignment of forestry successorship with UN declaration. I'm um, sorry, Cook B. Roseanne Casimir, to come to Shawatmuk. As a seconder, thank you very much. We'll go into the therefore be it resolved. Therefore be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly reject the industrial, reject the industrial industry commission report on forestry successorship because the recommendations do not uphold the self-determination of First Nations in BC over their forests and are not aligned with the UN declaration or the declaration act. The BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to work with the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and the First Nations Summit as the First Nations Leadership Council to call on the provincial government to not proceed with the IIC recommendations and instead <clears throat> honour their fiduciary duty to First Nations people and ensure that the provincial government's work aligns with the implementation of the UN Declaration free prior and informed consent and self-determination over successorship and three the bc afn chiefs and assembly direct the regional chief working with the union of bc indian chiefs and the first nations summit as a first nations leadership council to continue advocating for meaningful and robust consultation with first nations unencumbered by tenures and collective agreements that they were not signatories to so I'm going to go over to um, our mover, Chief Don Tom, to see um, if there's any comment at this time on uh, draft resolution number 13. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I think uh, really what we're uh, looking for is uh, to ensure that we're, we're upholding the uh, 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 DRIPA and also the uh, First Nations for the right to self-determination and uh, clearly the IIC report does not reflect that and so a complete rejection of it and uh, uh, thank you and I, I hope that uh, we have your support. Thank you and I will acknowledge that online if needed for any technical support we do have the legal counsel uh, for this. I'll go over to our seconder, uh, Cook B. Roseanne Casimir. Yes, you do have for the comments, so uh, microphone 28, please. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm in alignment with what Chief Don Tom said too, that it's more about ensuring and upholding, you know, the self-determination UNDRIP and, you know, just making sure that it follows those processes. Thank you very much to our mover and seconder. I open the floor for discussion on draft resolution 13, alignment of forestry successorship with the UN declaration. And I will make sure I keep an eyeball online as well. Thank you everybody as I keep one eyeball on site and one by eyeball on my screen. Not seeing any need for further discussion at this time. I'm wondering if we can go to question at this time. Questions been called. Is there any abstentions to draft resolution 13? Seeing none, is there any opposition to draft resolution 13? Seeing none, I'll declare it passed by consensus. Thank you for that. Moving on to draft resolution number 14. First Nations Early Learning and Child Care. This was initially moved by Chief Harvey McLeod, who I know is not currently in the room with us at this time. So we will be looking for a mover and we are also looking for a seconder. And I understand that Finette, um, for me, Chief Lee, you'll be moving that. Chief Lee Spahan will be moving that. Uh, Coldwater First Nation, uh, for the record, looking for a seconder now at this time. And number 22, please, into the microphone. Chief Dwayne Martin, Pinche with them. Thank you, Chief Dwayne Martin. Noting. And Vanessa is online with us right now, if we need it. Is that correct? I said I had a note that Vanessa was going to be online with us if it was needed. Is that correct? Okay, well, no, that's all right. It's an old note. <laughs> Checking. <laughs> Notes from Tuesday night. Uh, pardon me, just making sure I got all my ducks in a row here. Uh, so uh, thank you again to uh, Chief Spahan and Chief Martin. We're going to go right into the therefore be it resolved. Therefore, be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly reaffirm the First Nations have an inherent right to self-determination and the that the proper title holders must be supported in resumption of jurisdiction over our children and families, including early learning and child care. The BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief working with the BC Assembly of First Nations and the First Nations Summit as a First Nations Leadership Council to continue engaging with the province and federal governments along with the First Nations Education Steering Committee and the BC Aboriginal Child Care Society as appropriate on ways to best support First Nations with early learning and childcare in their communities and with regards to any implications for First Nations education. Three, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly call on the provincial and federal governments to work with the First Nations Leadership Council, supported by the First Nations Education Steering Committee and the BC Aboriginal Child Care Society, to immediately create an interim framework to flow funding under the child, um, to flow funding under the Canada Wild, to flow funding under the Canada Wild <laughs> Early Learning and Child Care Agreement, the CWELCC, to First Nations and for the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly call on the provincial and federal governments to engage in government to government dialogue with the proper title and rights holders regarding a permanent funding arrangement for early learning and child care dollars available under the CWELCC. So I'm going to go over to Chief Spahan if there, oh, I see you pulling your microphone forward as the mover. So microphone 13, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I fully support this resolution. Um, I know even within Coldwater there, when we start talking to our expectant mothers that, you know, that we allow our language to be taught at an early age because, you know, they say even when the child is in the womb, they, they still, they can still hear you and still listen. And I fully support this resolution. Gokshem. Thank you very much for that. For our mover, Chief Lee Spahan, I'm going to go over to our seconder, Chief Dwayne Martin. 
Microphone 22, I see you leaning into it, so with the assuming you want to speak. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> as a new nation, um, I fully support this, and our nation supports this. Uh, again, we, we, we need to look after our kids, our families, so through this process, I, I believe that we can make it work. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. I'm now going to open the floor for draft resolution number 14, First Nations Early Learning and Child Care. So the floor is open for discussion on draft resolution 14. Part of me, it's just the Lysol wipes that want to make me sneeze. Uh, any need for further discussion at this time on draft resolution 14? May we proceed to question? Question has been called. Is there any opposition to draft resolution 14? Abstentions? I know I just switched it up on you just to see if you're paying attention. Any abstentions? Seeing none, I particularly passed by consensus. Thank you for that. We're now moving into the late resolutions as presented to me. So um, this that one does, first one does not have a number. Would this be? Okay, so it's just the title. So late resolution, the first late resolution that we're dealing with, you have received a package was handed out a little bit earlier today and I believe also shared online. Yes. So the very first one, the late resolution, is Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case on First Nations and Child and Family Services, comma, Jordan's Principle, and Reform of Indigenous Services Canada, and the related agreement in principle dated December 31st, 2021. This, I don't know if we still have Chief, Ca I think I might've seen them come in, Chief Cameron Stevens, and then I know Chief Harvey McLeod is no longer with us. So I'm just going to, getting messages here, just give me a second. Okay, thank you. We do have um, uh, um, participatory representative who can provide some background to this. We have uh, Mary T.G., president of BCX online as well to help out with this if um, is so needed. Um, so I'm just looking for a mover and a seconder on this. Now, did I see um, Chief Cameron Stevens? Can you just please check if Chief Cameron Stevens is online? I thought I spotted them come into the room. Yes, so Chief Cameron Stevens, can you turn on your camera or wave a hand or something so we know that you're there? There you are. Fantastic. Thank you very much for joining us today. So um, and if you just keep it on there so we can go to you in just a minute. We are looking for a seconder on this late resolution, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case on First Nations Children and Family Services, Jordan's Principle, and Reform on Indigenous Services Canada and the related agreement in principle dated December 31st, 2021. Risala, I can that. Thank you very much. Cook B. Judy Wilson, Nisconleth First Nation will be the seconder on that. Thank you very much. So I'm going to read into the record the therefore be it resolved because it has been handed out. So hopefully everybody's had a chance to peruse it. And then I'll go to our mover and our seconder for any further comment at this time. Also acknowledging that you may call upon your participatory representative for further um, background to this. So therefore be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly call on Canada to immediately release the full 19.0 $08 billion in funding in accordance with and as provided for in the agreement in principle on First Nations Children and Family Services, AIP, Jordan's Principle and Indigenous Services Canada, ISC, Departmental Reform. A 1B, ensure that the final agreement must include provisions to cease Canada's operational and administrative discrimination in Children and Family Services and Jordan's Principle and prevent the recurrence of discrimination on an ongoing basis beyond year five of the AIP. C, 1C, ensure the final agreement protects the benefits for, ch for children, youth and families, as well as First Nations and First Nations agency service providers arising from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal and associated orders as a minimum standard on an ongoing basis. 1D, extend the time frame to end the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in brackets, the tribunal, jurisdiction, and fully implement the reformed funding approach and the agreement in principle 
with an extension until such time, in brackets, anticipated to be 12 months, but possibly longer, in the event of unforeseen circumstances, close brackets, that First Nations are aware of the proposed long-term funding approach and have had sufficient time to exercise their free, prior, and informed consent to any such approach that will directly affect BC First Nations and their citizens. 1E, extend the time frame to, to end the tribunal's jurisdiction and fully implement the reformed funding approach in the agreement in principle until such time as a fully developed and transparent alternative dispute resolution mechanism is implemented and approved by the tribunal. Two, the BCAFN chiefs and assembly direct the BCAFN regional chief to advocate that 2A, any negotiation on the final agreement that affects First Nations children, youth, and families who are citizens of First Nations in B British Columbia be conducted in an open and transparent manner with meaningful consultation with First Nations and First Nations children and family services and Jordan's principles experts in British Columbia through negotiating throughout the negotiating process. 2B, the Assembly of First Nations ensures the meaningful participation of the National Advisory Committee on First Nations Child Welfare, in brackets NAC or NAC, Indigenous governing bodies and First Nations title and rights holders and the BC Indigenous Child and Family Services directors in any proposal affecting First Nations Children and Family Services and Jordan's principles in British Columbia. 2C, the Assembly of First Nations only sign a final agreement in this matter after receiving writ the written free prior and informed consent of First Nations in British Columbia. 2D, that the Assembly of First Nations not sign any agreement that federates disclosure of information required by First Nations leadership to exercise their free prior and informed consent, including but not limited to non-disclosure agreements, liability waivers, or clauses requiring AFN to take any public or legal position that impacts First Nations children, youth, and families that are not specifically authorized by the BC AFN's chiefs in assembly and three, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly affirm that the Assembly of First Nations must seek the free prior and informed consent of First Nations British Columbia prior to stating or implying a position on behalf of First Nation rights holders in British Columbia regarding matters flowing from the 2016 CHRT2 or the AIP. So I'm going to go first over to... No, let's go into this thing. <laughs> sure, if you need it, me too. I absolutely will. It, it was my honor, Don. Chief Don Tom, deadly uncle, OG. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll go Let's over go to again. you, our mover, Chief Cameron Stevens. If you, as mover, if you have any comments at this time. No, no, just. just uh, Cook B. Judy Wilson, we'll get to you in a minute. I just know your mic is live right now still, and we're going to go first to our mover, Chief Cameron Stevens, as mover for any comments that you may have at this time regarding this late resolution. I um, Chief Cameron Stevens, do we have a technical issue with you? Is he still with us? Yes, I am. Oh, there you are. Excellent. Thank there you. you. Well, first of all, I think it's... Um, I think it's important to, uh, you know, have our expert. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for for having me on. First of all, and um, and it's important to uh, utilize our, um, you know, our, our experts in in this particular field. And I'd really like to call on um, Mary T.G. to, uh, you know, provide some some comments because she could uh, do do this. Uh, I guess more eloquent, eloquently than I. So I'd like to call on Mary T.G. to to do so, if you don't mind, Mary. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, uh, Mary T.G. as president of BC Acts and many other hats that you wear. Um, we'll open the floor to you for comments, expert comments at this time. I, I, there's two resolutions on the floor, I think, and I, I think um, I could speak to both of them at the same time just for uh, just to expedite the process. I know it's been a long day and I really thank you all uh, and I really do appreciate you um, providing me the opportunity. I just thought, thought it was really important to clarify some of the um, discussion and I know there's so much you're inundated as, as leaders and chiefs uh, with so much information in the last little while. 
And I think that's why really, when we talk about it, uh, both Cindy and I, that we really need to proceed with caution because again, this, these are final settlement agreements that we're talking about. Uh, when it came to the compensation discussion, uh, there has been information sheets that has been sent across Canada to all the leadership. But what some of the, ca the, the cautionary pieces that we were talking about yesterday is the, um, the understanding that as chiefs, what we are really requesting um, from uh, uh, the, the AFN legal from Canada is that there be some trans that there be transparency and we really look at what does free prior informed consent. Now, when you receive the compensation uh, presentation at the AFN AGA, the compensation agreement hadn't even been sent to some of you. With the compensation agreement um, as the Caring Society, uh, you know, we weren't part of those class action discussions, but we hadn't seen the compensation agreement, uh, the final draft before it was actually filed in court. So literally you would have had like, um, if it was sent out to you, it would have been two days before the AGA and it was presented as a fait accompli. But there is still um, the, the, the concerns, as we said, there is an existing AFN resolution that was passed a, a couple of years ago that said that the chiefs and assembly agreed that 40,000 per person in the class was the floor and anything over and above that we were fine with. Um, there are too many things that are, uh, that are very precarious in the compensation agreement that we've looked at and we've provided that analysis to you via information sheets, but those can be resent by the society. Uh, so we know that, um, for example, what we're concerned about are uh, the, the uh, ability for those that wouldn't receive any money at all, not even the 40,000, their ability to go back um, to, to Canada. There's, some, there's, there's uh, issues around indemnification. I think at the end of the day, what we are just requesting with this is that there would be more time for you, we, for you to be able to understand and, and for, for you to actually read the agreement and then let's work together to say, okay, this is the best solution so that we're not leaving any children out that would have normally been provided the 40,000. There's, we actually um, have done an analysis. There is a, a chart that shows who would be missing under the, 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 common, the compensation for uh, final settlement agreement compared to the CHRT order. So you can see it's, it's quite a large class. We just want to make sure that the original CHRT order's integrity is maintained and this, the class action should actually enhance what's already what we've already won and is court ordered. Um, so in a nutshell, that's sort of what, what we're, we're trying to say. We also know that within the agreement, um, there's an article 10, which uh, stipulates that uh, part of the agreement is that um, uh, the article 10 reads that the AFN agrees to act as a lead applicant before the tribunal in seeking the above order. Um, and that uh, they also agree that it uh, agreeing that the final settlement agreement satisfies its compensation orders and they will take all reasonable steps to publicly promote and defend the agreement. That's right in the article 10 agreement. So whatever is there, the AFN lawyers will publicly promote and defend the agreement. So well, we've never seen that in the agreement, but it is there. So once you re review the compensation agreement, you'll have your ability to have free uh, prior informed consent, which is so important. Now, the one thing around the long-term reform, which will be your, um, another resolution, in BC, it's- Can, as can I we come said, back to you for the long-term yeah. reform? Just, yeah. okay. I, sure. you're gonna be online with us, right? So yeah. I will I'll make sure we come. I but, you're there, we appreciate it. We'll just put a pin right there and come back to you. Thank you so much, both to you making yourself available, Mary TG, as well as Chief Cameron. We'll go over to Cookby Judy Wilson as a seconder for any additional comments at this time on draft resolution, late resolution on the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal case on First Nations Children Family Services, Jordan's Principle and Reform of Indigenous Services of Canada and the related agreement and principle dated December 31st, 2021. Uh, thank you, and thank you uh, for Mary T.G. for the update. I know we heard from Regional House in the uh, Woodhouse uh, uh, yesterday, and also, you know, outlining some of the issues, and also Cindy Blackstock was uh, reaching out to me as well with these issues. Uh, so, you know, they are serious issues that we need to uh, work through, and I think the resolution will do that. 
So I'd like to just uh, say uh, supporting it and seconding it, and I don't want to take up too much more time. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that, Cookby Judy Wilson, Mary T.G., and Chief Stevens. I'm going to now open the floor for discussion on this late resolution. So our first late resolution of the package is a need for further discussion on this resolution. Questions been called? Um, is there any abstentions to this late resolution? Seeing none. Any opposition to this late resolution? Seeing none, I declare it passed by consensus. Thank you very much. We'll go on to the next resolution, which I believe we had our expert uh, talk a bit about, about around the compensation. So this late resolution is compensation for family, uh, pardon me, compensation for children and families who suffer discrimination in delivery of First Nations child and family services and Jordan's principal, Jordan's principal services. This is moved by Chief Cameron Stevens, and we are going to look for a seconder on this one, um, as Chief Harvey McLeod is no longer with us. Uh, so Chief Lise Bahan Coldwater is um, our seconder. Thank you very much. We'll go into the therefore be it resolved, and I better take a slug of tea. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> so, therefore, be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly call upon Canada to immediate pay, immediately pay the CHRT ordered compensation in the amount of 40,000 plus interest owed to eligible victims and provide necessary supports pursuant to the CHRT orders. The BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly affirm that the AFN negotiators are not authorized to seek a reduction in the compensation amounts for eligible victims who are members of BC First Nations and must respect the compensation framework agreement and compensation entitlement order as set out in 2019 CHRT 39 and 2021 CHRT 7. Three. The BC Chiefs and Assembly expressed concern regarding the AFN's agreement to Article 10 in the final settlement agreement as it abrogates the AFN's duties to represent the interests of First Nations as authorized by the AFN's Chiefs and Assembly and direct the AFN A, so 3A, withdraw its consent to this section of the agreement or in the alternative B, fully disclose its obligation to First Nations governance, First Nations experts, the courts and tribunal, the public, and that an independent panel of experts and lawyers be appointed by the BCAFN to examine the final settlement agreement and inform positions arising from it. Four, BCAFN Chiefs of Assembly affirm that the AFN is not authorized to sign provisions such as Article 10 of the final settlement agreement on behalf of the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly without their free prior and informed consent. Five, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the AFN negotiators to seek the free prior and informed consent of BC First Nations Chiefs before making any legal representations on any final agreement on compensation that may have an impact on First Nations children, youth and families in British Columbia. And I believe that's the last one. Yep, number six, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly direct any negotiation with Canada or Class Action Council on any matter arising from 2016 CHRT2 and subsequent orders or legal proceedings affecting BC First Nations children, youth and families must be conducted in an open and transparent manner consistent with free prior informed consent of First Nations. So I will go over to you, Chief Stevens, as a mover, if there's any comments that you have at this time on this late resolution regarding compensation. Uh, yeah, I'd like to refer to uh, Mary Tiji, please. Thank you. Thank you. And I know you got us started, uh, Mary. I invite you to continue on with that thought process. You you <laughs> seated just a little bit earlier. Please proceed. I had I had already sort of spoke to the compensation piece already, um, and I think we just did this in reverse order because I I was I, um, hadn't spoke about the long term reform, but basically the same um, the same uh, issues and concerns that we had is is that, you know that there hasn't been that. Um, the, the input that we, we needed from the chiefs and assembly and especially from the community. So the, the, the concern again, 
uh, as I said earlier, what the compensation agreement is that there were too many uh, children and families that, uh, and parents that are going to be excluded from that. So we just needed more time um, just to, to get the, uh, the best agreement that we could. I just wanted, uh, and uh, with, with your indulgence, just to speak to that last, the long-term reform that I just wanted uh, the chief in assembly to understand that right now there is a, um, the data collection and the information collection coming across the country that's going to inform the final settlement agreement hasn't been completed. In fact, the uh, input from, from the British Columbia is very low. There's only 33% of the surveys and questionnaires have been, um, have been gathered as of yesterday. And in order to get like really to ensure that even the more remote communities, the smaller communities, that we have enough data, we'd need at least 50% and we don't even have that yet. So there's no, we're not gonna have time to get all that information and then get a final settlement agreement and get rid of the, the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal by December 31st. So both of those um, resolutions are speaking about just having, practicing our due diligence because our children deserve that. Thank you for that, both uh, Chief Cameron and Tim Mary TG again. Go over to our seconder, uh, Chief Lee Spahan, if there's any need for, uh, wish to further comment on this uh, late resolution. 13, please. Oh, nothing to add, no, I agree. Move into question. We're going to open the floor first to further discussion on this draft resolution, uh, this late resolution compens on compensation. We have uh, Judith Sayers uh, under the title of proxy at this time. So we'll go over to online Judith Sayers. Uh, welcome, Judith Sayers. Thank you. I guess. I don't know. I, I just seem, I feel a little bit confused. Um, yesterday we had the presentation from AFN and I don't understand why, like uh, this was a late resolution. Why didn't we ask them about section 10? I would like to have heard their input on it. I'm not doubting anything that you're saying in any way. Uh, I know we met on last, um, I, last Monday um, as New Chanoth, and we had Cindy Blackstock speak to us, and one of her recommendations is that we should have more information, more time to discuss this, and I would love to see that because I am still feeling a little bit confused about this, um, and uh, so, yeah, so yeah, that that, yeah, was, that was the that recommendation, was the recommendation that we came yeah. um, from with New Chanoth, and you know, I I kind of have read the briefs you know, about what's in the package. And I'm hearing the concerns, you know, that some of our children may not, or their families may not get this 40,000. And I would really like to understand it a bit more. I took a picture of that image about the number of children in care on reserve and off reserve. And so I, I just really feel like I could use a whole lot more information so I can um, be more fully briefed. And I guess part of this is, is I haven't had enough time to get involved fully. I just wanted to express that not speaking either in favor or against the motion at this point in time. So thank you. Thank you for those comments. Uh, at this time, I will refer to you as proxy, uh, Judah Sayers. Um, <laughs> keep me on my toes with your titles. Um, is there a need for further discussion at this time on this draft resolution on compensation? Seeing none, may we proceed to question? Question has been called. Is there any abstentions from this draft resolution on compensation? Seeing none, is there any opposition to this draft resolution? Again, seeing none, I'll declare it passed by consensus. Thank you for that. I think we're, is this the last one or second last one? Am I getting hopeful? Two more. Okay, well, gee. <sighs> I can dream. I can dream. We're almost there. All right. Here we go. Well, thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> uh, late resolution, renewal of service level agreement, mm -hmm. SLA, regarding British Columbia First Nations children and families. This was moved by Chief Kazmir Proxy and seconded by Chief Stuart Jackson. Um, and you are both in the room right now. Thank you. I can see you both clearly. We're not there yet. Sorry. I'm... Okay. 
So we're going to go straight into the therefore be it resolved, therefore be it resolved, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly acknowledge need in the interim for a bilateral strategic level agreement regarding the funding of child, child protection services of First Nations children ordinarily resident on reserve between Canada and BC in brackets SLA, while at the same time confirming that focus must shift to the broader transformation of children and family services, including a new funding framework for all First Nations child and family services in BC. For greater clarity, BC First Nations are not party nor approve the bilateral, bilateral SLA and remain committed to full and priority transformation of child and family services, including to fiscal relationships. Two, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief working with the UBCIC and FNS at the Tripartite Working Group on Children and Families, in brackets TWG, to request improvements in this renewed SLA, including A, enhanced funding, B, incorporation of principles from an act respecting First Nations, Inuit, and Métis children, youth, and families, and the Reconciliation Charter for First Nations Child and Family Wellbeing in British Columbia, endorsed by resolution by the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly, and C, enhanced accountability and reporting for BC First Nations about the use level and outcomes of this funding. Three, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief working with the UBCIC and FNS at the TWG to prepare a comprehensive update to the Chiefs on transformation of children and family services, including a new funding framework for all First Nations children and family services in BC for the upcoming All Chiefs meeting on children and families in November 2022, and seek a further mandate for key aspects of this work following this engagement with the Chiefs. So I'll go first over to our mover, uh, Cheryl Casimir, at microphone 19. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this resolution is for delegates' consideration, um, consideration to provide the mandate and the support for the, I guess it's like an extension or an interim um, bilateral service level agreement. And the, there is, as part of the work that we're doing to transform child welfare services here in British Columbia, we've been tasked with the um, the work to work on creating new funding models because the existing models we know um, do not really support the work that needs to happen on the ground. Um, as this resolution states, the service level agreement is between Canada and British Columbia and it provides funding to those children that are on reserve that are not supported by an agency. And in British Columbia, I believe we have 81 communities um, that fall under that category. So. We have been reviewing the service level agreement by way of the um, a company that um, we've contracted with, Ference and Company, and this work has taken place at the tripartite working group level, so the Leadership Council Canada and British Columbia. We also established a fiscal uh, working group, of which Mary Ellen uh, Terpel Lafond is the representative for the Leadership Council, along with reps from BC and Canada. So in the absence of that work being concluded to date, um, we are seeking the support for this interim SLA so that services don't get interrupted that, um, for funding that needs to continue to flow in those communities. But we also are wanting to let you know that um, work is underway to create new fiscal models here in British Columbia to support child, child and family um, programs and supports for First Nations in here. And that's the bigger picture that we're working towards. But this is interim. Thank you. Thank you for that. For from our mover, we'll go over to our seconder, Chief Stuart Jackson, on microphone 13. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I had a brief conversation with uh, Cheryl yesterday to discuss this issue, and and I support it uh, entirely. Um, uh, models are are uh, definitely something um, that can change, like like uh, policies. They're like a living document, and it can change and it can evolve. And so long as the, the focus is on um, the responsibility that we as leaders have in our, in our province and hold, uh, hold the, the country accountable to the responsibilities that we have to our children that need our support um, from, you know, from you know, feet on the ground and, and how we perform uh, services and, and support and programs, I mean, we have to change our frameworks. We have to uh, 
continue to evolve because situations change um, with our children and our families and in our communities. And it's our responsibility to uh, assure that um, we're doing our due diligence and we're upholding our responsibilities as leaders to uh, do the, uh, what's in the best interest of the children that need our support, need our help uh, with that quick step. Thank you for that from our seconder, Chief Stuart Jackson. I'm gonna open the floor now for further, uh, for any discussion on renewal of service level agreement SLA regarding British Columbia First Nations children and family. It is a late resolution. So the floor is now open for discussion. <laughs> uh, we'll go to microphone number 28, please. Hi, so my question is, um, I don't know, if is it possible if we could put in a derogation clause? Because I know that um, some of the communities throughout the Schwatmik Nation um, are working on their um, child welfare agreements. I know Simk did theirs, and I know that uh, within SNTC, we've also been working on our STEMA melt um, with our child legislation and made a lot of steps towards that. So you're looking for a friendly amendment to include a clause, and uh, do you have the wording? You're looking for help on that wording? Yeah, maybe some help. Just a simple little derogation clause that acknowledges that other First Nation communities may be, you know, working on and implementing some of those. Cook's Jam. There's some thoughtful percolation happening over here. I do believe in collective wisdom, particularly at the end of a day. So I'm going to suggest that we just briefly table this one, if the, with permission of the mover and the seconder, and come right back to it. Is that okay? Just to get that language in there, I'm going to go to Cheryl Kasmer Proxy. Can we do that? Um, briefly, 19, please. Um, I think I understand um, the concern and the, um, the reason for wanting non-derogation language, but I think it's just really important to um, recognize that this is not an agreement that we're signatory to. It's Canada and British Columbia. We're just wanting to ensure that they are aware of the um, issues that we want to see incorporated in a new SLA, and that's the work that's happening with Ference and Company and with the Fiscal Working Group. Okay. So are we okay if we leave that out then? So we're not going to worry about that. All right, thank you very much. We got good dialogue happening here. Is there need for further discussion at this time for this resolution on renewal of service level agreement? Question has been called. Uh, is there any abstentions to this late resolution renewal of service agreement regarding British Columbia First Nations child and families? Seeing none, is there any opposition? Seeing none, I declare it passed by consensus. Thank you very much. We'll go on now to the late resolution. Call to rescind and repudiate Terra Nullius and the Doctrine of Discovery. This is moved by Chief Jerry Jack and seconded by Cook B. Judy Wilson. I see Chief Jerry Jack straight across from me and I saw, there you are right in my, my little window on my screen. Uh, online Cook B. Judy Wilson. Thank you both for being here with us. I'll go right into the therefore be resolved. You have had a chance to look at this as this was handed out earlier and made available online for our online delegation. <clears throat> and I'm going to have another sip of tea to get into the therefore be it resolved. Therefore, be it resolved that the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly fully rejects the racist and colonial doctrine of discovery as justification for forceful dispossession of sovereign Indigenous nations from their territories. Two, the BCAFN Chiefs in Assembly fully supports and endorses the findings and recommendations outlined in AFN's Dismantling the Doctrine of Discovery Report and Recommendations 1.16.1 1 and 1.16.2 of the 1996 Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the Truth and Reconciliation 
Commissions of Canada's call to action related to the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius. Three, the BCAFN Chiefs and Assembly call on King Charles III to renounce the doctrine of discovery and likewise renounce all doctrines of moral superiority asserted in aid of colonialism so that the Crown does not continue to rely upon or use these doctrines in aid of a, in aid of a colonial purpose, especially as the Crown has distinct and lasting fiduciary obligations to the Indigenous people of Canada and around the world. Four. The BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to call on Canada and BC to repeal and reform all policies and legislation that are founded on the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius and recognize Indigenous inherent sovereignty, jurisdiction, self-determination, and five. The BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to call on the Federal Minister of Justice, David Lametti, to include formal rescinding and repudiation of the Doctrine of Discovery in Canada's BC 15 action plan and to press Minister Lametti to ensure the policy and legislative measures in the, B, the, part in the Bill C 15 action plan reflect the rescinding and repudiation of the Doctrine of Discovery and six, the BC AFN Chiefs and Assembly direct the Regional Chief to continue to call on the Pope to rescind and repudiate the Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius and recognize Indigenous inherent sovereignty, jurisdiction, and self-determination. So we'll go over to our mover. I believe that is microphone number 18. So to our mover, microphone number 18, Chief Jerry Jack. Thank you, uh, Clark Wheeler, Chief Jerry Jack. I fully support this and it's self-explanatory in the wording in the resolution and uh, I so move. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go now online to Chief, uh, pardon me, Cook B. Judy Wilson as a seconder further um, Comments at this time, quick beauty. Uh, experience and the timing, end of the day here. I also have a three o'clock uh, Zoom call regarding homelessness. Uh, so I fully support the resolution. I think it's timely on the with the Pope's visit and then his uh, admission of uh, genocide. And then also, you know, coming back to the bishops and the archbishops on a statement on the repudiation of the doctrine discovery and also on. Uh, King Charles now coming into uh, the monarchy uh, and the 70 year reign of 70 year reign of Queen Elizabeth, it's time to deal with the repudiation of the doctrine discovery. And it's the, the one thing that, you know, I, I think that's in all of the things that we need to do. And it's, it's also in keeping with the UN declaration on all of the things that we need to uplift ourselves from. And the time is now. So I fully support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much, former mover and seconder. I'm gonna now turn to the floor to our chiefs in assembly and online, aka also in assembly via hybrid means. If there is further discussion on this late resolution, call to rescind and repudiate Terra Nullius and the doctrine of discovery. So further discussion on this late resolution. Seeing none, go to question at this time. Thank you. Is there any abstentions to this late resolution call to rescind? Seeing none, any opposition? Again, seeing none, I declare it passed by consensus. Thank you very much. That is all of our resolutions on time and late. Um, I have two last things to do, and that is um, turning to Regional Chief TG for some brief comments, and we're delighted as well to call upon um, Herb Morvan, who has been with us, to offer some closing, uh, um, a closing, closing prayer. So, with that, I'm going to get out of the way, and um, I think this is my last time at the podium, basically, other than to adjourn it. So, Cooks Chatcham. Once again, uh, thank you, Rochelle, for. Uh, navigating our way through this very ambitious agenda over the last three days and and certainly I appreciate all of you uh, all the chiefs that attended the last three days the the ones that are still here diehards uh, uh, it's Friday afternoon and and certainly want to keep my um, comments short uh, certainly we had some difficult discussions the last couple of days in regards to fisheries and also in regards to, to emergency management. 
those are evolving discussions that, that need to be had in regards to how we deal with some of these matters that are very important to, to many of us here in British Columbia. On October 12th and 13th, there will be a First Nations uh, Fisheries Council meeting here in this building, so there's an opportunity there. Also at the uh, First Nations, uh, or the Union of BC Indian Chiefs uh, next week, I believe, September 27th to, to 29th, uh, some of the resolutions that were passed here will be there as well, mirrored resolutions, as well as the First Nations summits October 19th to 21st, another opportunity for more discussions on some of these really important resolutions and perhaps uh, add some additional wording. Uh, certainly, I think, you know, when we talked about uh, child welfare, a very evolving uh, matter uh, in regards to, to the resolutions that were passed. First and foremost, in, in terms of, of the, the compensation, uh, what the resolution states that we get the money out, but don't leave out some of our children. That's what that basically the, 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 the basics of that resolution. Long-term reform, we just need more time. We're almost there. We're almost there. I, I really believe that we can't lose this opportunity in terms of the, the $40 billion in terms of compensation, uh, despite the fact that we do have some difference of, of opinion and perhaps uh, uh, in regards to how to go about that. Um, I think it's, it's way too important, especially in regards to, to our children. Um, Certainly, there's there. I want to thank all of those that that attended um, uh, the, the the guest speakers, the, the ministers, and all those that attended uh, uh, Mendocino, Miller, um, and also Lametti from the, the federal government, as well as uh, Murray Rankin, uh, Minister of Indigenous Relations and Reconciliation, uh, Minister Ravi Kalon, and Deputy Commissioner of the New. Uh, Deputy Commissioner uh, that's been in for a year. I attended his uh, changing of the guard, if you will, uh, uh, the day before we started uh, our work here, and certainly look forward to those discussions and making sure that our relations with not only with um, uh, the new Deputy Commissioner, but also with municipal police uh, and uh, the many jurisdictions of, of policing, and, and also further to that justice, which is my file uh, at the Assembly of First Nations. I'd be remiss to uh, not uh, to, to acknowledge um, uh, MLA. Uh, Michael Lee is here uh, to my left. He's raising his hand right here. He's the, the, the critic for Indigenous relations at the legislature. I, I certainly hope that you've been listening to some of the discussions that we've had here today in regards to some of our affairs with the, the provincial government and certainly would like to have uh, some words in, in regards to what is occurring. Uh, certainly changing times in regards to uh, what we're dealing with here uh, as we continue to find um, graves at, at many residential schools across Canada. Uh, the numbers are in the thousands and the work that um, uh, Cook P. Roseanne Kasmer is, is doing, and many other chiefs, and, and um, it's important that, that we breathe life into the next steps. And when we talk about reconciliation, and, and I had the, the opportunity to, to talk to Dr. Chief Robert Joseph, we were talking about many non-Indigenous peoples talking about reconciliation. And I've gotten, gotten this question as, as well, perhaps you have too as well, is, non-Indigenous people asking, what can I do? How can I breathe life into reconciliation? And knowing and understanding the, the space you take up, knowing and understanding Indigenous peoples here in, the, in British Columbia, but also uh, really fighting racism. That's part of rec reconciliation. It, it's it's uh, changing times. Uh, there's a real opportunity here, especially as we see uh, the changing of the guard, if you will, uh, to, to King Charles III, also the, the TRC, uh, the apology from, from the Pope, and, and many of these, uh, the progress that, that we have here in, in British Columbia with uh, the, the work that we're doing with the First Nations Leadership Council in regards to implementing uh, UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration 
for the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act and also the work that we need to start expediently in terms of the national implementation of the United Nations Declaration of Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I want to thank my board of directors. Um, really, I, I think you know some of the work here, uh, could be Roseanne Casbier, uh, Chief Linda Price, uh, outgoing board of director, uh, Chief Councillor Elaine Moore, Chief Jerry Jack, Chief Harvey McLeod. I uh, just want to, to hold my hands up to you and thank you and, and also newly uh, minted, elected, uh, or accl acclaimed uh, Chief uh, Harlan Schilling for, for taking the position as the new Board of Director. Uh, Re-elected Justin Peters. Uh, look forward to, to working with him the next three years as well as Taylor uh, for the next year as we do have uh, an election next year for, for uh, female youth. Um, and also our, our women's uh, rep, uh, Louisa, I know she had to travel home, Louisa Hosey Jones for the, the good work that she's been doing. The prayers that uh, Dr. Gwen Point has been doing uh, for us, starting us off in a good way. And, and Dr. Chief Robert Joseph for, for all the work that he's done with the BCAFN. Um, none of this would have occurred uh, without the help of my staff back here. All here, I just want to give a hand of applause to, to the, the staff, uh, my chief of staff, Vanessa West, uh, Jamie and Maureen, who are, you know, really there for me in regards to, to policy, and all the other staff that um, uh, I've accumulated over the last five years. Um, when I started this uh, five years ago, I had, uh, I had three staff. And the other day we had a board of directors meeting and a staff meeting of well over 20. And some of them I, I just got to meet for the first time because of the pandemic. Uh, but it, it's, it's all that, the, the staff that really help and support the work that we're doing to, to implement those resolutions and the, the work that we need to do and, and to support not just BCAFN, but also support the First Nations Leadership Council. I wanna acknowledge uh, Chief Don Tom, Cheryl Kasmer, Robert, for being here as part of the, of the FNLC, Hugh, uh, Cookby, Judy Wilson, and also uh, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. As we all know and have heard, he's, he's recovering from, from an injury of, on his shoulder and certainly hope that he comes back uh, stronger than ever. Um, certainly the, the work that we are doing there is, is really important as part of the First Nations Leadership Council. So with that, um, there are a number of meetings, as I've stated, with the, the UBCIC First Nations Summit, uh, First Nations uh, Fisheries Council. We also, at the end of November, November, November 28th is the engagement with the, uh, the ministers of uh, the province and the chiefs, the leadership gathering uh, on November 28th. And then we, in Ottawa, we do have the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly, Special Chiefs Assembly, December uh, 6th to 8th. We've set on a date for our Special Chiefs Assembly uh, uh, for the BCAFN next uh, spring and on March 2nd to 3rd, we're, we're, we're looking for a place uh, that meeting is usually somewhere in, in the province of BC. The last two, two years we couldn't uh, meet. Um, as you well know, we're in the pandemic. Uh, prior to that, we did meet in Nanaimo, uh, Merritt, uh, Prince George, uh, but we'll be looking and scoping out places. So if you have any ideas, um, you could come forward to me or, or the board or my staff and, and we'll uh, try to figure something out for that meeting. So with that, I, I just want to, to uh, thank you all, Masi Cho. I want to say a big thank you to, once again, to our chair, uh, to getting us and navigating this very ambitious agenda. And this agenda, you know, it's part of the problem is that, you know, we, we had these AGMs and, and Special Chiefs Assembly online. So there's a culmination as soon as you get back, there's, there is a lot. And, uh, and if you need more information, certainly go to our website or ask our staff. So thank you, Russell. I do have a gift for you. Thanks. 
Let's give a hand to, to Rochelle and thank her. Um, and to, to end, I call forward uh, Herb Marvin to, to say a prayer in, um, in place of uh, uh, Dr. Chief Robert Joseph. He had to go and, and, and go home. And, and I also want to, to acknowledge uh, Dr. Gwen Point for, for her prayers and, and for being the two knowledge keepers. Uh, I think I'm the fortunate of having two, two doctors that, that are uh, really knowledgeable about uh, uh, being a, you know, uh, in their position. It certainly is, um, you know, one of those things as we, we come here and meet in person, uh, I think it's really, uh, I'm very happy to, to see you all here. Um, it, it's, um, as we come out of this pandemic, we're not all the way through it, but uh, it's good to see everybody. So. Herb, if you want to come forward and say a prayer, close in a good way. Thank you all. Masicho. Just before I ask you to rise, Scott and Dioch, the name Scotty, as Wakum, can skim Stitchcom, as Maskim, Gartis, Gartis, Law, the Mugand of the Accent of the Year, Ik heb nu een eerst lang, toen de vrienden te hem raakt, ze wachtkom en schim stichtkom, jukt op de eerst karede massaal. I first would like to offer my thanks to our brothers and sisters from Musqueam, who have opened their hearts to us so that we could do the work that needs to be done. To do the work that needs to be done. And they offered their hearts to us. And I would like to thank you for understanding and respecting that gesture. So, be proud of yourselves. Those of you who are still here are meant to be here. You are the ones who are going to do and support the work that you have asked the board of directors and the staff to carry out. You have a lot of work to do. Each time you ask someone, I shared with you earlier, to do something, you have to stand up and be supportive. It is up to us as our ancestors have always done, to show what it is that we want done, so that as we show, we're working with, as opposed to asking for. And I thank you for your courage, your willingness, and you've shown your commitment to your people by staying here till the very end. Um, garden, William Wantuk's garden. One of our ancestors shared with us that we should not leave a meeting before its completion. When we do that as individuals, we will be worried about what we didn't hear and we won't be able to explain 
to our community what it is that is expected of them. And we won't be blessed by the hearts of those who have stayed and fulfilled their commitments to their people, to their community. So each of you has done that. And to the staff, their commitment to the responsibility of being supportive, to get the work done in a good way. Thank you. That's what keeps everything alive. And remember that we are alive today. We're not survivors anymore. We are alive because we are willing to own. We are willing to do. And that's what matters. Now I'll ask you to rise. COVID has brought us a lot of pain. COVID has taken some of our knowledge keepers, some of our hopes for our future, some of our supporters who see a need and take it on. The community builders who see a need and take it on. That's who each of you are. Kaltzak means an empty village in our language. And I asked our mother, our late mother, why do we refer to those who work really hard as those who are creating an empty village? She said, Niditin Haram Gut Elis Kutla. Elis is to, to um, enhance. They are the ones who are going to enhance our needs to, to, to fruition so that it gets done. So thank you for each of you, your bravery, your courage, and your willingness. Now we're going to remember those who are in mourning, those who are in need, those who are lost, and those who need just a little bit more. And to remember our children, our grandchildren, our nephews and nieces, in whose lives our hopes for the future lie. And we cannot forget our community builders who keep us alive. I'm like a child. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm going to wish the God could give up. 
Thank you, a token of appreciation of a gift for uh, Elder Morvan. Thank you, Safe Travels Home, and thank you, Musqueam, for being such gracious hosts. And the cooks, Masicho, thank you. That concludes our meeting. Masi. Meeting's over, but we have some door prizes. Uh, Chief Brian Tate, you have.